begin our afternoon session. Kindly get seated. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our session on trade and the digital economy in Africa. We have an incredible panel with us, but before we get started, let us watch a video uh, from the Under Secretary uh, of the United Nations, Amina Mohammed, speaking to us from uh, New York, I believe. Let's have a look at what she has to say. Ladies and gentlemen, I commend the African Union and the European Union for co-organizing this important regional dialogue with UNCTAD. I also express my appreciation to the government of Kenya for hosting and its incredible leadership. The increasing importance of the digital economy is quickly changing how we live and work. Enhanced connectivity across Africa propelled by a growing youth population, increased mobile penetration, technological innovations, and the proliferation of applications is positively changing the socioeconomic landscape of the continent. E-commerce and digital technologies are creating new markets, consumers, and products. E-commerce is creating new opportunities for employment, entrepreneurship, and investment. It is reshaping business models and transforming domestic private sectors, notably small and medium enterprises. And it is dramatically changing government policies and traditional notions of borders, tax practices, and definitions of goods and services. While we welcome this progress, we need to ensure that we do everything we can to address the persistent and still wide digital divide. That divide will continue to loom large exacerbating inequalities if we do not act now on the issues of access, affordability, data literacy, and capacity building. Digital technologies have enormous potential to help us to achieve the sustainable development goals, build an inclusive economy, and uphold our promise to leave no one behind. As countries incorporate digital technologies and e-commerce into their development efforts, support from bilateral donors, development banks, and the private sector will be crucial. In that context, UNCTAD's E-Trade for All initiative is a welcome effort to make it easier for developing countries to find the support they need in key policy areas. Let us also recognize the significant gender dimension of this work. The digital economy offers many opportunities for women. Special attention should be given to women entrepreneurs and women-owned businesses in terms of access, financial services, and skills building. By allowing a greater access to markets, information and trade networks than ever before, e-commerce also provides our young people with increased opportunities. We need to ensure that today's education equips them with the essential skills they need to thrive in a digital economy. Ladies and gentlemen, the United Nations looks forward to working with you to make e-commerce and digitalization a force for good in and beyond Africa. I wish you a very productive dialogue. Thank you. Let's give her a round of applause, ladies, ladies and gentlemen. gentlemen. I commend the African... Oh, thank you. In this afternoon session, uh, we are going to look at trade policies that can be used to promote intra-Africa trade and digital developments in Africa. We want to look at preconditions for ensuring that trade benefits African countries, that it is inclusive as well. We want to look at how to promote coherence, which is so important. And also, we're going to be talking about the Africa continental free trade area and the provisions that need to go into that to make e-commerce work for this continent. My name is Julie Gishuru. I am an Afro-optimist. I believe it's possible. We have an incredible panel. Allow me to introduce them to you now, starting with Secretary General of UNCTAD, Dr. Mukisa Kitui. Can we give him a round of applause, please? And right next to me, I have Anna Hinojosa, Director of Club Compliance and Flat Facilitation World Customs Organization. Round of applause, please. <laughs> also with us and right next to me is Bishar Hussein, Director General of the Universal Postal Union. <laughs> Seated next to him is Ethel Kofi, CEO, Edel Technologies of Ghana. And last but certainly not least, we have Andres Ansip, Vice President of the European Commission. 
to get us started in our discussion, let me ask uh, uh, Secretary General Mukisa Kitui to please give us opening remarks for this session. Oh, thank you very much, <clears throat> Julie. Um, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, mem distinguished members of the panel, uh, good afternoon and welcome to this uh, session. We at UNCTAD are glad to associate with our partners, the Economic Commission for Africa, uh, Africa Union, in facilitating this session of the conference. And we similarly are glad for the cooperation and support, first and foremost from the European Union, um, the government of Germany and the government of Kenya for making this possible for many of the people present here to travel here from their countries. There's no gain saying the reality that e-commerce has grown phenomenally. By the measurements of UNCTAD, by 2016, the level of e-commerce globally had reached 25.7 trillion US dollars. 90% of this is business to business, 10 being business to consumers. But still, even then, cross-border e-commerce remains globally constrained. For example, business to consumer e-commerce in 2015 amounted to just $189 billion out of such a phenomenal amount. And also, only 380 million consumers made purchases overseas through websites. As countries grow to adjust to optimize the possibilities that come with this new phenomenon, it's very clear that e-commerce and the digital economy do not happen by accident. That there has to be purposeful organized action in order to realize the potential of e-commerce. At a time when Africa signed up the Continental Free Trade Agreement, uh, which was signed in March this year in Kigali, the potential of intra-African trade, and particularly services trade, is hinged on having minimum acceptable standards and conditions between the member states to realize the potential that exists. Similarly, governments have to invest in the right skills, skills appropriate for the requirements of the digital economy. Governments have to create the, in, in, in the, the policy framework both for protecting online users, protecting the privacy and data, but also importantly protecting the integrity of the payment systems. Governments must build a physical infrastructure through which the promise of electronic transactions will be kept by logistical companies like postal services and other movers. It's a time when we realize the importance of across government engagement as necessary to unlock the potential of e-commerce for developing countries. In addition to the high level panel on digital cooperation that was launched by the Secretary General of the United Nations, the Digital Economy Task Force launched by the G20 uh, during the presidency of Argentina and thankfully with the support of uh, UNCTAD and the very, very important and pathfinding digital for development uh, program of the European Union, we are seeing purposeful action in forming activity of governments in defining where their people have to go. The time could never be more appropriate than today that we start building a momentum, policy advocacy, policy engagement, demonstration of actions that governments cannot afford to be left behind. I want to share one example that uh, I've shared before at the General Assembly in New York. Many countries you talk about digital inclusion and they say, oh, we don't have, we don't have uh, the infrastructure to include our people. We don't have electricity in our countries. Let us first build infrastructure and then we build other things to follow. And I give them the example of Kenya. Four years ago, the president of Kenya announced a policy that the government was going to supply a laptop for every kid studying primary school in Kenya. At the time, electricity in Kenya covered 20% of the population. Mm. And a lot of cynics were saying, how can you supply computers when you don't have electricity? Fast forward four years, 
not all the computers have arrived, but 80% of Kenya has been electrified. That the desire to be compliant, to be ready for the computers, added political pressure to bring electricity to the people who are complacent about dark nights. Now they did not want dark schools. So sometimes there is a reinforcement. Prioritizing in some areas can be another push for infrastructure that has taken forever not coming. I want to invite you to this dialogue, and I very much hope that we gain from your experiences, your visions, and interactively, we build a community that will be pushing forever for greater public attention and practical action for Africa's inclusion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. What an instructive example that is of what is possible when we put our minds together, when we focus. Um, we are going to start our panel session right now, but allow me to just let you know that in a short while, the Secretary General will need to exit. Thank you so much for making time to be here. And also, uh, the Vice President uh, will need at some point to exit as well. But it's great to have you both on the panel. Uh, allow me to also introduce a panelist who has just joined us, uh, Daniel and Rose, founder and CEO of Manobi from Senegal. Thank you. To, yes, you may clap, you may clap. To get us started, um, Andres, let me come to you now. What is, it, what is it that we require in terms of an enabling environment when you look at what Africa needs urgently to put in place to make e-commerce work for Africa? Um, what are those things? Please start us off. Thank you. No, I think. Could you turn on the machine? The switch is on the top. Technology. Okay. There we are. Now Thank it you. works. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my first advice is, uh, if I may, to provide some advice, mm -hmm. is not to copy those mistakes we made in the European Union. So. When speaking about preconditions for to get to this flourishing uh, digital economy, to get to uh, the <clears throat> flourishing e-commerce, then of course we have to discuss about connectivity and about affordable uh, prices for connectivity. In the European Union, uh, GSM, 2G time was really a um, good time for us. Europe had leading position. But then with the 3G, all of the governments, they started to ask for maximum amount of money from operators. And of course, you will get much more money if you will not set concrete criteria, time limits, etc. for operators. And then governments, they were quite happy because they got huge amounts of money. They were able to increase salaries of teachers and policemen. And then one day we had to say Europe is lagging behind because operators didn't have enough money for investments anymore and in fact a uh, number of licenses was limited and uh, market was blocked. No need to hurry up with those investments. So with 4G, majority of EU member states, uh, uh, they uh, acted uh, differently. Their aim was to cover the country as soon as possible with new generation networks. And when setting concrete criterions for coverage, for example, time limits, you will not get maximum amount of money, but uh, I am absolutely sure those governments uh, who set those criterions, uh, they didn't lose in revenues uh, uh, because a uh, new generation of network was available in those countries and uh, their economies, uh, they were able to grow faster. Mm -hmm. So. Connectivity and affordable connectivity is the first precondition. Then, of course, trust. Trust is a must. If people, they cannot trust those digital services, they will never start to use them. Or if people, they lose their trust, then they will stop immediately using those uh, d digital uh, services. It doesn't matter. Are we talking about public services or, or uh, private uh, services? So, data protection, 
I'm happy to say that uh, our European general data protection regulation became practically as a global standard because uh, during uh, the last year, uh, approximately in 100 uh, different countries, uh, they got their first ever data protection rules, and uh, those rules are very similar to our general data protection regulation, but to allow free data flows across borders. Mm -hmm. The same story, and to guarantee at the same time uh, a confidentiality of communication. It's, it's a must. Then, <clears throat> about digital single markets. I'm vice president uh, responsible for uh, digital single markets. We were able to create single market in physical meaning in the European Union already more than 20 years ago. And all the member states, all our people, they benefited uh, uh, from this uh, single market. But sorry to say, four years ago, digital single market practically didn't exist in the European Union. Instead, to have huge digital single market with 500 million healthy customers, in fact, we had 28 relatively small markets. Well, global service providers are able to deal with those 28 relatively small markets. But I even don't think that... Um, uh, fragmentation of this market is some kind of um, those uh, um, uh, unique selling propositions for uh, global uh, service providers. They would like to also to be more focused on, uh, on quality of uh, their services. But for small and medium-sized enterprises, for startups, it's absolutely impossible to understand about those 28 different sets of rules in Europe uh, and to scale up it's a very complicated or uh, impossible in Europe uh, and uh, this is uh, the reason why smart startups, smart people, um, they had to leave um, from Europe to the United States where there is single market with uh, more than 300 million healthy customers. Mm -hmm. So we didn't want to send that kind of bad message to our people, startups, stay at home or go to the United States, and that's why we decided to create digital single market in Europe. And my advice is uh, to try to create uh, this um, uh, single digital market uh, for African continent, um, uh, try to, to go on with this African um, uh, continental uh, free trade um, area. So 70-80% uh, of exports uh, uh, in Europe, they are going to other EU member states. This percentage is uh, five times smaller uh, here in Africa. Right. Practically, Africa is, um, is dealing only with um, China and uh, the European Union instead uh, to create trade also uh, here inside of, of Africa. So single digital markets uh, will support all kind of um, digital developments in the, this African continent. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Let's stay with that point. A single digital market for Africa. Europe learned. It went through the process. Um, Africa needs to have its own. And, you know, with that, um, I come, Ethel, to you and your experience. And, and you're providing consulting services. I want you just to take a look at your environment. The opportunities that an integrated digital Africa would present to you in your business. Um, and, and what appeal would you make to those who are working on this continental free trade area and the urgent need to ensure that digitalization is part of this? Please. Sure. Thank you for the question. Um, I think I speak for private sector to say that um, private sector always loves um, policies that enable deregulation, right? Anybody that works in private sector and, and loves the idea of deregulation, and I'm, I'm no exception to that. There are two, two areas that I think deregulation is um, a really big um, catalyst to the growth of e-commerce in Africa, mm -hmm. one being um, fintech, so financial technology and payment systems across the continent. So if you look at the continent as it stands now, there are a few uh, payments, big payment players, um, but the, the, the thing is they're in three, four, five countries, right? Because 
the regulations and the, the banking systems across Africa makes it really difficult to scale on the level that will enable them to have economies of scale. The, the thing is, in order to make cross-border payments happen, we've, they, they've got to be able to scale into larger and larger amounts mm -hmm. of countries. And in doing that, then the rates are cheaper uh, for us. Because now, if you look at it, I think um, across the continent's average, you're paying three to five percent in charges in terms of using cards. Right. Now, that's a little on the high side um, if you look at sort of other, um, other ecosystems. And so I'm, I'm quite keen on deregulation around sort of the payment side of things in order to boost uh, uh, across the continent. And, and then, of course, there's the uh, free movement of persons. That's really important. So in my space, part of what I do is I work with corporations to ensure that they can do digital transformation in a systematic and effective way. Mm -hmm. right? And so part of, part of that conversation is I, I work within the West Africa region, but it's, that's easier because um, I, I live in Ghana, and the West African region, it, it, ECOWAS region, enables free movement. Uh, in that region. So it's easier to do work and to scale into countries in the ECOWAS region. Right. Now, I'm, I'm seeing the, the ability to scale across East, uh, East Africa and, and other parts of Africa because then I, you know, it's, it's easier to move people around. So those are the two spaces just in terms of enabling um, companies like mine to, to build and scale across the continent because what we are looking for is scale in the, in, in the providers in the ecosystem. Thank you for that. So deregulation uh, around payment systems, absolutely critical. It's too complex and too expensive right now and, and, and free movement of persons. And I think we do still keep coming back to the same primary issues that are causing uh, uh, problems. I want to come, Daniel, uh, to your experience from Senegal and, and, and just to tap into the whole idea of um, what you're doing, what a, 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 a single digital Africa would mean for your work and what your appeal would be to stakeholders, whether it's government regulators, whether it is the development partners working to transform the situation in Africa, what would your message be, please? No, I think if we want to... You need to switch it on, please. Thank you. On the top. There we go. Yeah, thank you for the question. I think if we, if we, if we want to talk about which kind of transformation that we can attain. It's important to know where we are right now. Okay. Uh, so that we can appreciate the path to this transformation we are, we are talking about. Uh, Africa is still dominated by uh, rural population. And Africa economy is still dominated by agriculture. And all the trends say that, yes, I mean, within the next 20 years, 30 years, that will be the case. So, is there an opportunity to transform Africa using digitalization while addressing specific value chains that are important for the economy and the well-being of African, of African people? And I do think that one of the most, uh, uh, for us, and I think also in many countries we can consider this is important, how we can use this technology to improve life of the majority of the people on this continent. Right. For sure, we need technology. It's good. We have uh, different technologies on the table. Uh, the, mobile, the mobile technology is really one of the most uh, accomplished uh, technology. Uh, what has been achieved in the, in the, uh, in the uh, mobile, te in mobile sector is, is unique. Uh, other sectors like, uh, you know, if you compare a water sector, a water pipe network with today with a water, with a mobile network. It's mm -hmm. In terms of efficiency, I mean, it's, it's not comparable. In terms of digitalization, it's not comparable as well. So yes, I mean, we have this technology, we have other ones which are coming, um, like um, um, artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. like um, satellite, satellite imagery. Mm -hmm. Uh, like uh, blockchain, like IoT. So we have plenty technology on the table, on the shelter. And the question is how we can arrange this technology so that we can improve the performance 
of the priority, the, pri the, pri the, the main value chains that can really transform Africa. So how do we ensure that our adoption of technology is inclusive and drives Africa forward in terms of transformation? It has to respond to two main questions. Mm -hmm. The first one is how it can improve into the value chain the performance of every actor. Okay. Whether it is at the bottom of the pyramid or at the top of the pyramid. So the students, the farmers, the teachers, the, farmers, the, the, the leaders, everybody. Then he has to see how he can reduce the frictions which are existing today mm -hmm. within, uh, uh, among the transactions that these different actors want to set up along this chain. Mm -hmm. So if it's still complicated for a farmer to get access to a credit because the bank no, don't know where he's living, don't have any track record of him, or, or, on him, how can we use this technology in order to lubricate okay. this relationship between the farmer and the bank? And how we can stimulate the market itself? And then finally, mm -hmm. help to uh, the, uh, the e-commerce be developed in Africa. Right. Because we will have then a very, very good reason to do that because it will impact directly life, life of people. So thank you for that. And I'm going to come to you in a moment, and Hussein, I will come to you in a moment as well. But uh, Secretary General, I just do want to tap into you on this issue that has been raised by Daniel of inclusive development around this digital economy. And um, we know in Africa there are places where the disparities are just immense. And what must we do to ensure we don't make the same mistakes when it comes to opportunity in digital. What, what are your thoughts on this? First of all, <clears throat> yeah. to me, the driving force for the direction you take is a developmental state. Okay. You have a government which has a sense of purpose and can align all the necessary factors to do things. If you look at what we're enumerating, this is an all of government effort. It cannot be one ministry. The minister for ICT cannot decide where a road will be, <laughs> cannot, address, uh, cannot make customs more efficient. Mm. So it's all of government has to be there. That's one. The second, those who went ahead have gained, have benefited. The first set of countries which liberalized telecoms had advantage of premium payments by companies buying in, and they had sufficient resources to drive the fixed and mobile uh, broadband. Today, the margins of most telecoms in Africa have come down. They do not mm -hmm. have the kind of resources to roll out the infrastructure that they had before. And secondly, with reduced margins, telcos will go to large human concentrations. They cannot do the countryside among the poorer consumers. And as the main benefit moves from voice to data, the data consumer services are urbanized. So the left behind cannot be included by the safaricoms and the orange of this world the way it was 10, 15 years ago. Mm. Which means in the states that are late adopters, it is more on the public uh, spreadsheet that they have to invest in the infrastructure. And for others, the areas that are left behind, they cannot be driven by the market alone. Now, globally for Africa, we have two problems right now. Mm -hmm. One, that in some areas like the Northern Corridor, the road from Mombasa to Kigali, you have tech giants like Google and others who have been offering to build mobile, I mean, broadband inclusion, fiber optics from the coast to the heart of Africa. Mm. But now, starting 2018, most of the big giants are pushing their resources into fifth generation, 5G. Yes connectivity, <coughs> they, ha they are not connecting with the kind of uh, CSS that we, we, we were seeing before in this kind of projects, mm -hmm. which now means more attention has to be made by governments. Uh, so this is just some of the considerations that we are at a moment where it has to be all of government. It has to be leaders who know where they want to take their societies. And it's our duty to try to find how can we smoke out those who are reluctant to embrace the challenges. <laughs> who are looking for excuses to remain analog in their politics. How can we smoke them out? That's, that's an interesting discussion that could be had. But so your argument is that government must be involved and it's all of government from education to, to, to transport to everything. And similar to the subsidization of public transport, somehow it must come in to subsidize access 
and affordability. Is that, that's it. To, to make sure that subsidy, yes. it's a public utility. Okay. Today, broadband inclusion is just like having a road and having running water. It, it should be seen as a public utility. Thank so you. government is not subsidizing. Government is doing what its purpose is all about. It's, it's serving. It's actually providing a service. Um, let me come to the customs perspective on all this now, Anna. And, um, you know, we're talking about a single digital Africa. We know the challenges in cross-border movements of, of people and products. Um, t tell us what you see in terms of opportunities and the challenges that we need to deal with, please. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. I think, um, I think there are a, a great deal of opportunities. Clearly, um, Africa hasn't quite uh, exploded with e-commerce as some of, the other, some of the other geographic areas around the world, but I think there, there's a good opportunity to, to, to avoid, um, as the Vice President said, some of the mistakes that some of the other regions have made. Um, I think that some, what, some of the areas uh, that I think would be helpful is what we're seeing, uh, is especially as it relates to cross-border movement of parcels, um, it, we're seeing that many of the uh, border agencies, certainly customs, but, but there's other border agencies that are responsible for, for making sure that, that medicines that make it into the market are, are good, agriculture products, uh, any other products that they're inspected at the border, they're overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. They're overwhelmed with, with um, the volume of small parcels that are coming through, whether it be in the postal environment or through the express courier environment. And, and the, the solutions um, are, are, I think, connected to, to the digitalization, the, the automation. Uh, we've been working very closely with the Universal Postal Union on um, collabor collaborating with the postal operators to make sure that, that the postal operations become more automated so that, because the key for customs administrations is to be able to do uh, a good risk assessment. I hear from, from many um, private sector representatives that the part of the problem is the customs, of course, all of the border agencies have the title of customs because customs is the face, but many other border agencies might actually be involved in the process of inspection, but customs is the one that holds it, so customs gets the, 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 um, the responsibility for the delays. But um, I hear often this particular customs administration or that particular customs administration is just holding up our shipments. Mm, right. uh, they're inspecting everything 100%. And it's possible, and, and, and part of the reason that it's possible is unfortunately some of these customs administrations don't have other alternatives. Right. They don't have automated ways to be able to do a good risk assessment that would enable them to have better information as to what's coming their way, to be able to identify which goods and which products are actually um, safe and, and compliant and can move quickly through the process to enable them to use their already very limited resources to focus on those that they don't know anything about or that there are in fact higher risk. We certainly are encouraging the use of non-intrusive inspection technology. Today, in any customs administration around the world, it's, it's literally impossible to look at every single package. Right. And when you think you're looking at every single package, you're really not looking at every single package because it's such an overwhelming task. So the use of non-intrusive inspection technology is, is also very critical. But again, getting to digitalization, very important, and I, I'm sure that, that uh, Mr. Hussein will, will speak a little bit more about the work um, in the, in the, with the postal operators, but a, a, a good risk assessment is the key to being able to facilitate uh, uh, these parcels crossing borders for not just the customs administrations, but also for the other regulating agencies mm -hmm. in the, on the border. And I'll stop there because I know you want right. to engage the others. I, I, I want to, I, I, I'll come to you, Hussein, now, and it's very interesting because Anna and I were having a discussion earlier about the importance of the postal service. And of course, you spoke with us this morning in the session and you told us Universal Postal Union has launched Ecom Africa. So I want to start there. Take us through what Ecom Africa is and what it means in terms of, of, of building uh, this uh, digital one, this one Africa system of e-commerce and business. Please go ahead. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Julie. Um, 
Uh, colleagues, first of all, before I just answer that question, I just want you to understand what the postal network is like. To many of you, it's just a, a, an old building in, in this middle of the city on a corner of a village uh, which has not been painted for a very long time with very tired faces. This is the impression that, that comes to most of you. And if I ask you who has sent a letter in the last, the last uh, let's say, two years, three years, raise your hands, let me see. Last two, three years, who has sent a letter? Three, four. Amazing. I'm even surprised it's this wow. many. Okay. That was just a small exercise. Colleagues, Less than 10% me, of Let me room. tell you what I want to say here. First of all, the Postal Service has been in existence since the dawn of civilization. When men and women learned to read and write, we had Postal Service. I was in China. I saw they had a Postal Service dating back to 1,600 uh, 1, BC. So, the Postal Service has been there. We just organized the Global Postal Service. Every country had their own networks and systems, but we organized ourselves in a global body only in 1874, and that's when we created the Universal Postal Union. We have 192 members, and nearly 650,000 postal outlets all over the world, from the mountains of Himalayas to Drakensberg Mountains to the village in Burkina Faso and the farthest end of the world, you have a post office. There's no other organization that knows you better than the post. We know who you are. We know where you live. We knock on your doors and we deliver your services. We have been doing that for generations and ages and many. The reason why the post office has, we are talking about new is the transformation. In this digital age, We've been carrying parcels and packets since we were created. Mm -hmm. And e-commerce is nothing but really a physical delivery of items. You can have all the technology until and when they discover how to deliver a parcel through this iPad you're having. <laughs> Please get to know that the post office is still relevant. And that is the new horizon on space for us. Our normal social letters or mail has gone down. That's why I could see a few hands. Mm -hmm. But the digital space has opened a new horizon mm -hmm. where now our parcel and, pro and packets have gone really into, into different, uh, I mean, figures. Now, coming from there now, mm -hmm. there is one big problem which is facing the whole world. Inclusivity. We have talked about inclusivity. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goals talks about getting everybody on board. Mm -hmm. We have talked about globalization and said we have left behind many people. It's true. His Excellency just said that 60%, uh, I would say 80% of our people in Africa are living in rural areas. We have 7 million people who are doing the bits every day on the ground to deliver your items. In Africa, we have 26,000 postal outlets. In every village in Africa, you'll find a post office. Now, coming from there, this infrastructure if you're talking of inclusivity agenda, getting people out of poverty, creating jobs, creating uh, opportunities for women, and sure, I mean, what you call uh, and, and youth, that is the starting point. First of all, you have to provide service. We go with our financial services where no banks go. We don't go deliver where no other organization go. Even our competitors in the Korea missions, mm -hmm. I challenge them to go to Mandera. <laughs> where I come from, they'll close business tomorrow morning. You just want to cream off, just sitting here in big cities, and you leave the rural population to the, the postal network. So who's, postal. who's saying fantastic coming, journey? Coming back. Yes. E-commerce is now a one-stop solution, which was we designed, we, we wanted to solve this problem, because every single conference I attend like this, and I attend many of them, we keep describing the problems and mourning over its issues, mm -hmm. but no one has ever addressed a single one-stop solution for these things. Mm -hmm. E-commerce, e-com at Africa is a new concept which we developed, supported by 192 countries in a Congress resolution in 2016. I was mandated to come with an a, a, a innovative uh, solution, one-stop -stop solution. What it's all about is simple. We are not going to reinvent the wheel. We have the infrastructure for delivery. 
It may be rickety vehicles. We have we have something to improve. But the core thing here is how do you use the digital, what you call digital market, create a digital, single digital market in a country, and have everybody in that country on that platform. Mm -hmm. And this is the unique part of it. You may have the Alibabas, you may have the uh, Amazons, and everyone else. But here, the, the aim or the objective of this Ecom Africa is to create a digital market with everything else inclusive in one shop. You will have the customs uh, declaration, advanced custom declaration systems there. Right. You have the technology there. You will have the, what do you call, the cross-border issues. You have the governments with you. Then you have the citizens, every single business, small, big, medium enterprises, all of them registered on this platform free of charge. Read my lips, please. Free, free, free of charge. Of charge. Yes. <laughs> when you do that, that's where I pick from where my brother said. Please, I need to explain this. Please, literally, just give me a minute. He said the government is critical. The problem, the stumbling blocks are governments. If you don't get the government sort out the issues of customs, if they don't have the, the what do you call the airport uh, security system, you can't get your things out. Mm -hmm. You don't have the road right. infrastructure, you don't have the electricity, you don't have uh, an internet. How can you do business e-commerce? And this is the problem with FFS. So this one brings together, there has to be a national secretariat, not place the anybody other than the patronage of His Excellency, the President, to be able to drive this agenda and bring the customs guys, the trade guys, the, the every single person, the airport authority guys, the, the port, everyone together in one system. And then we have the, the what we call every the financial payment system to, to do it and have everybody on board. Once you have this system in place, mm -hmm. then we have already piloted this with six countries in Africa. Kenya is we wanted to create a hub covering about, let's say, 10, 15, 15 countries in East Africa, South Africa for Sassadek, uh, Cameroon for the ECAS, Economic Commission for Central African States, uh -huh. Cameroon for uh, what you call um, um, ECOS, yes. and Morocco, but Tunisia has also jumped on board, and now we are getting many other countries, Ethiopia, Tanzania, and others coming on board. Thank you. I'm going to come back to you on this Thank because you. it's important, and I'm going to come back to you with a challenge yes. about the postal services. But uh, before we do that, Andres, you will need to leave us shortly. So I'd just like uh, to get maybe a final word from you, having heard from the panelists right now. And, and, and as you exit, what is your parting shot? What would you like to leave everybody here thinking about top of mind? Yeah. <laughs> I like Africa. And uh, we all know Africa is full of creativity. In Africa, we can see lots of uh, really promising startups. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, today, those people, they have to leave to some other countries, mainly to the United States of America, to scale up their businesses. So there is a real need to create a fruitful atmosphere, environment uh, for uh, local people which will allow to scale up here in, in Africa for those companies. As it was mentioned in the very beginning already, uh, mentioned in the very beginning, uh, uh, in Europe uh, we created a digital for development uh, strategy. So we all know that uh, Europe was um, the biggest donator when talk, uh, globally when talking about uh, um, development cooperation. 32 billion years during the last five years uh, only from EU budget and together with member states, 82 billion years. But only 500 million of those 82 billion, they went into digital. Wow. So, mm -hmm. of course, we have to deal with those survival issues. There is a real need for that, but it's not enough to deal only with the survival issues, with drinking water, with food, with the roads, democracy, etc. People in Africa, they have the same hope that people in my country, in Estonia, for example, they have, using digital to jump over some kind of historical periods. And it's possible. In my country, in Estonia, I think we made a real miracle. Our economy is not on the same level with their economies that they have in Finland or in Sweden, but we are on the same picture, and it's, it's a miracle already. 
So, next, the uh, EU budget will provide more finances for uh, also for Africa, but I think you have to ask more for digital projects. Mm. And in this way, it's possible to create jobs here in Africa to keep those smartest people, young people here in Africa. And I would like to say that uh, in Europe, we are using already some kind of uh, uh, solutions created here in Africa. m -Pesa, very well known here in Kenya especially, but also used in Romania, in the European Union today. So, uh, this simulation uh, for um, jet aircrafts, for tires, for landing, was created in African continent. Right. Autos is building a second largest uh, supercomputer for uh, African continent, for Senegal. So, uh, now second biggest supercomputer in African continent is in Cote d'Ivoire. For what those 150 or 160 people working in this uh, supercomputer uh, center, they are, they are teaming mainly with, with agricultural issues. So it's possible to increase productivity in fish farms, uh, in uh, agricultural sector using AI, the combination of uh, the Internet of Things and, uh, and artificial intelligence using uh, uh, supercomputers also here in Africa. In my small Estonia, we got, as average from coal 20 years ago, 3.5 tons of milk. Then we put sensors on cows, cows they are getting feed in correlation with their production, feed is balanced. Now we are getting 9.2 tons of milk a year. Wow. 3.5, 9.2. They are using the same technologies in chicken farms, in fish farms. Today it's, it's possible to, to provide medical treatment to every single fish in those uh, fish farms. So. It's possible everywhere. You have to believe that you will be able to be the best ones in the world as runners, marathon runners yes. from Kenya. They are known as uh, the best runners, Olympic champions in the world. In the same way, it can happen also in the digital world. It is possible. Sorry, now I have to catch the airplane. I wish. All the best uh, to all African people. I'm looking forward to have really fruitful cooperation between the European Union and African countries. Thank, Thank you, you for inspiring us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you feel inspired? And uh, Secretary General, we will also allow you to exit. Let's give him a round of applause as well. Thank you very much. Do we feel inspired that it is possible? Yes, it Who is. knows what Mandela said? It always seems impossible until done. it is done. Absolutely. So we come back to our discussion, and I want to welcome to join us on the panel now. We have Stephen Parinki, who is from UNECA. Thank you, sir, for joining us on the panel. Also joining us uh, on the panel now, we have Claire Messina. Thank you, Dep Deputy Executive Director, uh, UN Secretary General, High Level Panel on Digital Cooperation. Let's give her a warm round of applause as she comes up to take her seat. So, um, you, you want to continue? I'm, come, I'm going to come back to you just now. Let me introduce Stephen and Claire, and then we will come back. And I love the passion. I love the passion. Stephen, um, you've heard the discussion so far. And uh, when you look at, at the whole agenda, Africa, one digital Africa, trade, inclusivity being part of that. Tell us what UNECA has been doing in this regard. How far have we come? And, and what is the plan moving forward? Thank you very much, uh, Julie. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I've been here since morning, and um, one of the things that I wanted to start with, oh, first of all, to finish the story of uh, the SG Kitui. Uh, so the increase from 25 to 80%, the beauty of this increase is that most of it is actually renewable energy. So most of the production is actually renewable energy. Mm -hmm. But having said this, uh, we are talking about um, a digital market 
for Africa. We have, African, we have the African continent of free trade area, which all of us are very proud of, that it was signed by 49 countries, 13 have ratified. We are waiting for nine ratifications for it to come into force. What is this market going to do? You're going to have an economy of more than $2.5 uh, trillion dollars, uh, with a population of 1.3 billion uh, people. But here is the issue of the conversations that we are having here today. Mm -hmm. Half of these 1.2 billion people are invisible. They have no legal identity. And I think this is the point that probably uh, Vera Songwe, the Executive Secretary of ECA, may have, may have alluded to yesterday, because you cannot be able to participate in e-commerce if you cannot be trusted. You cannot be trusted if you are not known. And you cannot be known if you have no legal identity. Mm -hmm. So what is it that uh, the Economic Commission for Africa is doing? And I'll be talking more about this on Friday. One of the things we are doing is actually to, uh, we have what we are calling a digital ID initiative for Africa. Mm -hmm. And this is not an ad hoc initiative. This is an initiative that is very well aligned to the Sustainable Development Goals. SDG 16, it's one of the targets within SDG 16 because the international community have committed itself that everybody who is born in this globe will have a legal ID, they will be visible, and none of them will be left behind. So we have this initiative, which is to establish a common foundation Mm -hmm. that is to promote, rather, not to establish, to promote the establishment of uh, a common foundation of a legal ID system that is interoperable, that will make it possible for a supplier in Kenya to be able to be trusted because he or she has identity by a demander in Burkina Faso, right. and at the same time, because of this existence of this legal ID system, to have a digital payment system where you not have to worry about many issues because your payment system will be dealing with individuals and businesses established by individuals who are known and who can be identified. We believe if we do this, the postal systems will be able to work and we can actually be able to optimize uh, the, the, the potential of the CFTA. I can come back to say that um, Phase one negotiations of the CFTA focused on the goods and services, and the SG talked about that. Mm -hmm. But we also have the phase two negotiations, which are going to play very much into the issues that will facilitate electronic commerce to its right. fullest. Right. Because phase two will be dealing with issues of intellectual property, competition policy, investment facilitation. And these are issues that uh, for morning, we have been discussing and saying, okay, if you have entrepreneurs who are using digital platforms uh, to create uh, new, new avenues of business, you want to make sure that their inventions are protected. Mm -hmm. You also want to make sure that um, there is a level playing field between niche markets of uh, digital companies with the big players globally and continentally. Okay. So these are some of the things that the ECA is working with the African Union and the member states towards the establishment, I mean deepening of the inter Thank you. Trade. Thank you. That phase two is absolutely critical to in, in ensuring that the provisions we need are actually incorporated. And I'll, I'll come back to that. Claire, let me get your perspective on this conversation. Of course, inclusivity is, is one of the, the critical aspects we're discussing here. What do you see when, where you are seated in terms of Africa, the opportunity, and the challenges in this digital environment? Try, try it, try it. Negotiating the technology, step number one. Ah, here it is. Uh, yes, does it work? Yes, just yes. hold it close. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> So uh, I'm, I'm representing the, high, the Secretary General's high-level panel on digital cooperation, and uh, the UN Secretary General established it in, uh, in uh, July of this year. I'm giving a bit of context for those uh, uh, who uh, don't know about it. 
um, to start a global conversation on how um, uh, different stakeholders can come together and work to ensure a safe uh, um, and prosperous digital future for all. It's chaired by Melinda Gates uh, and Jack Ma, and it will uh, uh, um, it's composed of 20 uh, uh, independent experts from all around the world, from government, from private sector, a lot of young entrepreneurs, women in particular, uh, academics, uh, technical community, etc. And it will uh, uh, provide a, a draft report for the Secretary General and the world by May of, uh, of, uh, of um, next year. So I'm here really uh, actually to listen more, more, more than okay. to speak and to hear what uh, your pain points are and what are the issues on which you feel uh, greater cooperation is required. So my starting point uh, and also listening to the, this conversation is that no single, ac no single actor can um, uh, uh, succeed uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the digital transformation. No single actor can do it alone. Mm -hmm. No single government, uh, no single uh, uh, entrepreneur uh, uh, or civil society or others. We need to come together. If we want mm -hmm. to achieve uh, uh, inclusivity, uh, uh, prosperity, we need to come together and, uh, and, and, and work together with that, to, to that aim. The second, my second starting point is that uh, you know, digitalization, digital transformation for what, right? It's not uh, an end in and of itself. The end is indeed inclusiveness. Uh, it's uh, uh, um, uh, kind of a, 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 a fair, fairly distributed uh, um, uh, um, uh, prosperity and well-being across uh, all uh, all segments of society uh, and all countries of the world. So if we if we see that, and you know, of course, coming from the United Nations, we have the UN Charter, the Universal Declaration um, of Human Rights as our spine, as our uh, DNA, and so for us, those principles are you know know, our lodestar, our, our uh, 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 compass, mm -hmm. as it were. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so if you keep these two uh, aspects in, uh, in mind, so where are we going? You know, we are seeking a more, in, a more inclusive and just uh, digital future for all, um, and we cannot do it alone. The question I would like to throw uh, to uh, all of you, and I would love to hear feedback from mm -hmm. panelists, uh, but also from, from uh, the audience, is uh, um, what are um, what are the areas? What are the the, 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 the issues on which uh, uh, each of you feel you cannot handle it alone, and where you right. need uh, inter um, uh, uh, cooperation among stakeholders? Okay, excellent. So I will throw that question to to all the panelists in a moment. But Hussein, I want to come back to you to continue taking us through okay. the opportunities you Thank have you. opened up. Yes. Thank you, Madam. Thank you. Um, I just want, I said a very heavy statement here that uh, all businesses, small or big, will be on the platform free of charge. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a dream in reality. Frankly speaking, we have all the addresses already. <laughs> and the second thing I want to say is that if it's the government wish that they want to promote trade, what is the biggest challenge to small enterprises, small businesses today? Mm -hmm. They cannot be able to put their product in the public space. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you a small ant, uh, anecdote. I was in Burkina Faso. I attended a conference there. After lunch break and I finished, they took me out for a small excursion to the Sosok marketplace. And I found two girls, young African girls, making a tablecloth. The tablecloth was the whitest cotton that I've ever seen, with a bulb, a beautiful design in colors. Eight sitter with the napkins and everything. I, I and me and my wife were in Switzerland. We had just moved there to take up this job, and we were looking for a tablecloth from one of the shops there. It was costing me 1,200 Swiss francs. But when I came to these girls and I asked them how much does this thing cost, they told me 12 dollars. I couldn't believe my ears. And this was better any time than what I found in Switzerland. I asked myself, why is it $12? I thought that I was stealing from this girl. Right. The reason is because no one knows her products. No one can see her product. And this is really, the, now if every, the biggest challenge is marketing for themselves, if that responsibility is taken away, that's the biggest selling point for some narrative any government can give to its citizen. Right. Number one, once you do that, the Ministry of Trade can provide that information to the, the, this platform, 
and everybody comes on board. Now, the, what you do is, we are not buying things from outside the, the world. It's not more, anything about today. What do you do with everybody? Probably the youth in this country or every African country may be sending what you call uh, Alibaba or, or, or what you call um, Amazon. Mm. What are we doing with it? We are buying small gadgets or things from outside. Are we selling our products outside the country? The answer is very limited. Now, the question is we lack the platforms. Our products are not visible. Our, every small mm. entrepreneur here is struggling to set up a platform, and again, they have the challenge. So if we set this up, we thought. Mm -hmm. And then we have a menu. We have all the countries. I click South Africa. I can see all the products A to Z. We can see their prices and everything else. And our product is visible. All these hubs and networks will be combined. It becomes a global African platform, just like Alibaba or Amazon. And this then will have a free zone trade so that we can even ask the government to synchronize their policies so that we, have, we can even have a, a, a kind of a, a, a pricing for it. So this is, the, this is the concept. It's not just a dream. Already six countries have taken on board. One of them is launching the first, uh, I mean, uh, full, um, full born Tunisia next year. We have just signed an agreement last week with Cote d'Ivoire. Kenya, we are signing today. I was with the minister today here. South Africa is already uh, advanced. So this is going on already. So what I want just to say is that uh, the UPU has the technology, they have the expertise, Thank they have you. the knowledge, Thank but you. what we are looking for is the support with our partners. We can't do alone. Thank you. So come on board. You are saying come on board, come on board. Come on board. So, very, very interesting. Um, I could interrogate this further, but I want to really delve into the question that has been asked and posed to each of our panelists here now. You're in this space doing what you do. Um, you've really articulated from your perspective as, uh, you know, already what your highlights, key issues are as, as we look at this digital, single Africa, uh, digital environment. Who are the players you really need? Who is that stakeholder or who are those stakeholders you really need by your side right now to help you transition to your next level? And maybe I'll start right here with Senegal. In your work, who do you need? Who do you want to partner with? What do you need to do? Again, we are not only in Senegal. We are covering different countries. You are actually present in 14 countries. 14 African nations. African countries. And, mm -hmm. and we are selling also some services in, in Europe too. So we have clients in Europe. We are talking about the value chain, mm -hmm. always. Which means that we are working with all the players along the chain. So we need everybody. Uh, and the technology is a way as I said previously, to, to organize, to, to simplify, uh, facilitates the relationships among the different players along the chain. If you consider, for instance, uh, I can give you an example. I give you two examples, one in, in Africa and one in France, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we are working with, uh, we have a platform named Africa Cocoa Village, which is connecting small scale farmers in every cost cocoa growers to the industry, mm -hmm. right? It's a platform, digital platform. You know what the industry wants to know? They want to know uh, where this cocoa comes from. Is it coming from a protected area? Is it coming from a, an irregular area? Mm -hmm. uh, what, what the farmer really does in the field? Right. Even it is nice on the platform, they want to know which kind of input is that used, mm -hmm. uh, which practices it used mm -hmm. in order right. to produce this cocoa and make a link between these cocoa practices, production practices, and the flavor of the final cocoa bar, chocolate bar. Mm -hmm. You see? Another example in, 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 in France, we are using the same platform and we are Vignus, they are using the platform just to be sure that they are, it's a cooperative, to be sure that the, the, member, the members, the cooperative members, are applying the proper technology so that they can select the wine, the, the different uh, grape, and, and, and produce a specific wine with that. Right. Okay. So always the same thing. They want to be sure that trustability is very important. And in order to do that, we cannot rely only on technology. We need people. Right. We need people to collect the data. We need people to control that the data, the quality of the data. Mm -hmm. 
we need people to supervise, we need people to analyze. And I think that is the opportunity also for Africa. Okay. Not only to structure the chain, but also create jobs for many, for the million of young people in Africa. It's a, no, it's a huge opportunity using the digital as a way also to develop phys physical jobs. Thank you, thank you. Continent. So information traceability, ensuring the way things are produced is? It's a honorability. Which, honorability. Which, which is, which is ah. when we are talking about commerce, I would use the word honorability. Okay. Okay. Regarding the product, regarding the way you are working with your customers, the way you are assuming your, uh, securing your logistic, mm -hmm. you are paying your clients, mm -hmm. you should be honorable and you should prove capable to prove that you are honorable. Thank you. We've learned a new term for those who did not know it before. Honorability. I, I love it. I love it. Anna, let me come to you now. When you look at the work you're doing in customs, the opportunities for Africa, who do you think are your core? Who are the core partners you need to work with? What is the work that you need to get done? Well, I think that f for sure, um, many of the, if I, if I put myself in the, in the shoes of the actual customs administrations from all of the countries um, throughout Africa, their concerns um, are very practical. So their concerns are to ensure that they're still able to collect the revenue for their country mm -hmm. because their country is, is dependent on that revenue for running the country to ensure that the, the goods that are coming into the country are um, not illegal. So uh, a lot of the areas that we've seen uh, e-commerce exploited for are moving weapons, drugs, and, and other uh, counterfeit and illicit goods. In some cases, um, a lot of the excisable goods like tobacco and alcohol being being really flooded into markets using e-commerce. So being able to um, have all also the fidelity of the data that um, that was previously discussed that the the information that is being provided to the customs administrations is accurate and complete and enables them to be able to do as I mentioned before a, a good risk assessment I do think that as as governments are investing in the digital infrastructure um, and in a lot of focus is going in on of a very real need, and that need is of, of educating and, and raising the capacity of the consumers to be able to, to deal in the digital environment. It's also very important to invest in and increase the capacities of the government agencies. Mm -hmm. And obviously we represent the customs administrations, but there's many other uh, government agencies that are at the border that need to be able to transition to that di digital environment so that they can, in fact, facilitate the trade. They can use an automated way of inspecting and doing risk analysis because it, if, if it, no matter how great the data is, if the customs administrations can't actually receive it and can't actually do the, the, the uh, risk assessment, then that data is worthless. So I think investing in, um, in the digital capabilities of the government agencies at the border is also a very important uh, factor to consider because everybody needs to be raised up at the same time. Right. I, think, I think that Claire mentioned that, that, that none of us can do it alone. And I think as Africa is, is going going to very quickly r uh, rise up, it will be important that those government agencies uh, be supported in that process as right, well. Right. Um, Ethel, let me come to you on the same question. Um, when you look at your work, who right now do you most need to work with, to partner with, to collaborate with, to take you to um, the next level? Right. So, um, I think it, you might need to switch it on. Hello? Yeah. Yes. So, there are different groupings, and uh, private sector needs, uh, especially in, this, in the burgeoning space, there, there is a lot of um, support needed. But I, I, I'd like to talk about it from sort of the, the Africa technology ecosystem partners in the ecosystem itself that it's needed, right? So you, you're looking at the technology partners. So the people like me that actually do the work around consulting, the building of the technology, that's one group, right? And then you have venture capital. The thing that's um, really good for us right now is even though uh, venture capital money that comes into the tech space in Africa is, mm, I think, less than 10%, and I've got to look at the numbers again, but less than 10% of what globally it goes into tech, mm -hmm. um, you will find that um, there are two spaces. First of all, there are five countries 
within um, Africa, and I'll speak to inclusivity in, in that part. There are five countries in Africa that um, get 80% of the venture ca capital money that comes into tech. So as you already know, South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, um, and then you've got your sort of Ghana and you've got Egypt in there. Mm -hmm. And out of those countries, the two spaces, so the two verticals where uh, most of the money goes are FinTech plays. So FinTech payments, and then e-commerce-like platforms. We've just come out of a couple of weeks ago where um, Twigger, which is an, a, a B2B e-commerce platform out of Kenya now, um, uh, I think IFC just uh, funded that by 10 million. So there is, in, in the space, the, the, the venture capital space, there is an interesting sort of attraction to um, the e-commerce place, which is the, the payment side of things and the, the actual uh, e-commerce e side. So they're, they're one of our big stakeholders mm -hmm. because as I said in, in another forum um, today, we have to follow where the money goes. Where the money goes is where there will be growth. And that's where we've got to be very intentional about what inclusivity is. Right. Because what then happens is we then create an elite set of countries and verticals that will then grow and surpass everybody else and leave everybody else in the dust. And then there's um, uh, other, the other group of stakeholders just, just within our, this ecosystem partners. So the trainers, um, I know there are a few people from um, Afri Labs, which is mm -hmm. the hubs and the technology spaces because if you look at Africa, the, the story of Africa and Africa's software development and um, technology growth, it's been largely driven by the hubs because they have been they have given cheap internet, cheap space and allowed startups to go and experiment and, and do things. So within our own space, those are the, 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 the supporting players that need to work effectively to ensure that we're training out and, and building out from the sort of technology side. Right. And then we've got your government <laughs> partners, right? And, and, I, and I've, I've said this multiple times since I've been here. Uh, the, we have had all these discussions around trust. And I'm saying quite simply, governments can be at the forefront of training its populace on how to use e-commerce and essentially grow the markets for the e-commerce partners. Right. How does government do that? Government needs to provide its services online. Yeah. As simple as, can I pay my tax online? Can I get a company registration online? Can I do these things online to enable the populace get used to using e-commerce um, or uh, going online to get the services they need? Right. And once they over time, it gets easier to then begin to say the leap from I pay, I don't know, my revenue tax online to oh, by the way, I buy shoes online. It's a really small leap. Right, 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 absolutely. And so those are the, for, for me, if government's going to do anything, there are all the logistics and all that, but it, and private sector, so I'm looking for the one outcome that can give us a boost, and I think that in that, that's where governments can push yes, us make a and change. give us space. I, I think, you know, Kenya might be an outlier here because in Kenya we do everything, uh, we do a lot of things online. Just last night I was applying for all my family for new passports, <laughs> for instance. Um, and it's all, you know, the process is online, the payment is online, it makes life very easy. Hussein, I come back to you with this same question, but looking at you in the context that you are championing the postal service as and, and the new platform, uh, the e-commerce platform, as as you know, a next wave that we must all pay attention to. And yet, um, the reality of where post offices are right now and the postal services right now is that uh, you know uh, we have single-digit percentages of of people who are using it. Right? Um, for a lot of people, it may be a little bit archaic. For my children, they might not even know what it is. So you're in an environment where you've got to welcome the world back into the postal union, which you say has been here since time immemorial. So facing this challenging environment, who for you are the most critical players right now and, and what is most important for you? Well, um, Madam, let me say something here. Mm -hmm. uh, the post office is not that archaic old institution that you, you had seen many years before. <laughs> we have okay. transformed and today we are really in the digital world, digital space. Technology we have used every single technology that has been adopted through the ages and provided services that are relevant. Today we are using drones to deliver services in other places. Probably, I mean, some countries may not have uh, adopted this quickly, but... Mm -hmm. uh, so, we are in the digital space. As I told you, we don't, our letter and social mail has gone down, 
but because of the digital this uh, e-commerce and the traffic, the parcels and, and every delivery system is what we are trying to perfect and set up a platform for ourselves. So the post office has moved on. It's not okay. the post office that you knew. That's one. Number two, what is it that is important for us? Mm -hmm. The important thing for me here is, first of all, I have to get a serious government that is ready to be able to take this e-commerce serious business. If they want inclusivity agenda, the post office, we don't leave nobody behind. And that's why we came with this concept of saying everybody should have on that platform. Mm -hmm. The other thing for me is partners, partnership. Resource will be required here. That's not, there's no, no, no kidding here. To set the platforms, the warehouses, and all the logistics and everything requires a, a very robust uh, resource will be required here. Now, where does that resource come from? It's a big question for us. Mm -hmm. Of course, UPU does not have a big bag of money. We don't carry around here going to addition to countries to set this up for them. It is upon national governments to take the national posts to take this and governments. Now coming to the point that it, this resource can either be provided by the national government as part of the infrastructure development for the postal network, like any other infrastructure, that we need that kind of infrastructure. Or when governments don't have money, and of course many times the post office does not really uh, uh, appear very much on high on their, on their agenda of uh, longer list of things they need to do, then there is a whole world of space available to private sector to partner with the post office to be able to set up that platform. Okay. So we have both options okay. and we have solutions for this. So we have developed solutions, we have experts, we have uh, MIT and, and professors in Harvard who are helping us to set up this logistics. This is not a small time thing. Please, this is I say, watch this space. I'm only trying to get countries that are serious about this <laughs> and once they are done, probably then, and then one final thing please before I get. Yes. Every player here is welcome on board on that system. We are not exclusive. Even you, the competitors, or the, 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 there is a space for them. The Alibabas will have to hook onto us as, as a matter of choice and, and others. So it's a platform not exclusively for the post per se, but everyone is involved. Thank but you. partnership is important here. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I, I, I advise you in this digital environment, maybe um, you can share a, a website or a link in the, in the next few Absolutely. days with everybody so they can plug in, Absolutely. plug into your system. I welcome everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Inclusive, inclusivity. Uh, Stephen, I come to you, back to you now. And, uh, you know, you've taken us through it. And I'm really fascinated and excited to hear about the Digital Identity Project because I, th I think that is absolutely key to ensure we're all moving forward, to open up access to financial services and so much more. Um, but now also uh, the provisions that we need to ensure go into the, the CFTA, there's so much to be done. When you look at the partners who are most essential for you right now and the issues that are top of mind, what would those be? No, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Judy, again. So for us, the Economic Commission for Africa, we are a regional commission. We are a United Nations body. And essentially, our mandate revolves around um, promoting uh, regional cooperation for social and economic development mm -hmm. of Africa. And so first and foremost, our most important um, uh, partners are actually governments. And so on this agenda that we are talking about here, now, you see, there are 22 countries in Africa with populations of less than 10 million people. Mm -hmm. Now, so if you were to think as, a, as a, an entrepreneur or as a, or as a firm, uh, the potential of uh, 10 million people in terms of growing your, your market, it is not very soon you hit the, 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 the frontier. Mm -hmm. So the continental free trade area offers an opportunity for scale for businesses and especially if you you partner that with the issues of free movement of persons so our key partners in whatever we do are actually the government trying to emphasize that it is important for them to bring down the fiscal barriers mm -hmm ensure that uh, Africans are able to move from one country to another. And now we are saying we can actually create the continent of free trade area, a movement of goods and services, and then end up with digital barriers. Right. Uh, because we cannot be able to pay each other because you have 
uh, payment systems that are not operable. Um, you have all these issues of currencies. Uh, I think Ethel uh, started by say, talking about the issues of uh, uh, payment, payment platforms. Mm -hmm. With um, a digital single market, where you have all these issues of legal identity dealt with, you don't actually need even to use all these correspondence banks that we have to use in New York or in London, uh, because our currencies, and, I, and, and for the women, because you had asked the question about women, I think yes. the, mm -hmm. the DSG talked about uh, women. There's a lot of informal trades that takes place across Africa. And one of the things that uh, these informal cross-border traders do, they, can't, they carry currencies uh, with them. Now, with a digital single market where you don't have to worry about issues of identity, they don't have to worry about carrying money because you have payment platforms with the people that you're transacting business with right. that you can trust. Right. Right. So for us, we just want the governments to ensure that they create the environment that makes it possible for goods and services, people to move, and also ensure even as they do that, we do not create new barriers because we are creating um, protected digital markets. We just want to make sure that we have an open digital market so that e-commerce can actually be able to optimize the CFTA and deepen intra-African trade. And there's a beautiful intra-African trade that I think Ankta Denisi always talks about. It is that most of the intra-African trade is actually of very high value. Right. If you right. look at what we trade in, most of what we trade in is value added. And so we already have a very good foundation for our industrialization process. Right. And so how do we look internally? How do we source internally? How do we trade internally? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. So I'm coming to the floor now, and we have a good amount of time to have a robust discussion and engagement from the floor. Uh, Claire, maybe tapping into you with any thoughts. I know you said you're here more to listen than to speak, but do you have any perspectives just before I head to the floor? Yes, I, I heard a few sort of uh, keywords. One is capacity building, building mm -hmm. the capacity of, uh, and I know, I mean, the sentence is a bit of a, you know, uh, trite, but uh, of, of consumers, uh, uh, citizens, uh, government officials, uh, the private sector, you know, there is a massive upskilling needed of, uh, uh, of those who will have to transition from the, you know, uh, analog economy to the digital uh, mm -hmm. economy. Um, uh, and, and I mean, we shouldn't underestimate the importance of that if we really want to realize the, the benefits of the digital transformation. Um, another, uh, um, I mean, scale is another, you know, sort of light motif that has come through uh, even um, uh, earlier earlier today. And um, uh, but I see also two opportunities in uh, that that you have in this region. That right. you know, I've, I've been traveling in various regions of the world, and and I haven't seen in others. For example, I've I've been in countries where the government where government has been very purposeful in. Uh, um, uh, driving e-government, right? In mm -hmm. driving the digitalization of all government services. And that is very impressive because you really see, you know, how quickly they have been able to do that, especially governments who are, you know, who have a sort of an authoritarian or a, a, a sort of a, a, a culture. But at some point, uh, so, in, it, so in the first three, four years, you see amazing progress. You are really very impressed. But then at some point, you see that it stops because uh, digitalization is actually a form of democratization. It, it, it means giving, uh, giving agency to, to people, you know? And so uh, it's interesting how these centralized authoritarian cultures are very good and very effective at the start of, a di of, of the digital, digital transformation, but at some point they hit a barrier because their citizens are not used to taking initiative, being entrepreneurial, taking their own destiny in their own hands. And I think a big advantage you have in this region is that people are incredibly entrepreneurs and are not waiting for the state to uh, um, uh, do things for them. But um, I haven't answered your question. You, you, what you were asking is, is there any, any question mm -hmm. I would like to throw um, uh, to the audience? Um, I think it's similar to what the one I've, I've asked uh, right. panel members. Right. Uh, what do you need from each other in right. order to be able to succeed, each of you, in your, in your uh, domain, in, in, in your digital uh, um, journey? 
Thank you, thank you. And, and uh, as I come to the floor, I told you I, I love African proverbs, and there's one that goes, and I might be misquoting slightly, um, uh, when you cross the river in, in a crowd, the crocodile will not eat you. Or at least the probability that you get eaten is a little bit low, right? Um, so we, we, we come at this conversation knowing that we must all move together, sir. I come to you first with your comments, your thoughts. Uh, please introduce yourself and go ahead. A lot of questions because yeah, it's, <laughs> gonna, it's, it's good. Questions. It's good. It's good. <laughs> Go ahead. Madame la Thank you very much, moderator. I'm called Abbas. I'm director of trade. Our uh, gadgets on, and can I can I ask please that um, we get some gadgets for translation here at the front? I will come back to you, sir, when we have them. Give me two minutes. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll start here. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, th thanks, moderator, for the chance. Um, listen to the speakers. Um, Please uh, introduce yourself. Oh, well. sorry. My name is Sylvester Fogwa from Ghana. Um, I listened to the speakers, and I could hear coherence and inclusivity, you know, and uh, uh, just concept about the post-com. I think it's a very, it's a very um, uh, brilliant concept uh, listening to you because it, it spreads across um, the, 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 the countries where, where you are post office and, and all that. And, and linking to that is the issue that it can actually transform uh, most of the communities that we have in, in, in Africa who are actually rural communities and all that, you know, and they want to be included in the development mm -hmm. process in Africa. And I, I think that, 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 that angle is very, very, very important and brilliant. We, we could pursue that. Linking to that is the, the issue. He mentioned that it's, it's our own platform. It's an African platform. Mm -hmm. And that could actually be used in terms of transforming Africa. And then the question is, a, 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 in that case, what is your view on the data ownership in, 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 in Africa, mm. in data ownership in Africa? And I said it because it, when I look at the ANTA report for 2018, the Trend Development Report for 2018, it makes a, a very clear point about data ownership in Africa and how data can be deployed, you know, to actual transform Africa. I mean, what is your view about data ownership? Just you know, before I respect? leave you, what is your view on data ownership? I think he's very critical, but I wanted to hear his view. I want to be very critical because in the sense that when you, if you have, a, a, let's say, ECOWAS, you, you own your data, yes. you can deploy the way you want to transform your economies and all that. So I wanted his view. And that, so I understand if, you want to his view, but yes. let's, let's be collaborative. That, yes. yes. So and if you were to advise him, on, on, on your perspective, you no, would be saying... No, he's pushing for, he's pushing for an agenda that I think is very brilliant. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, he made a very brilliant point that they need, uh, and, and it's actually an African platform that we, we can use to transform. Mm -hmm. And it links out with, with Daniel's point from, from, from Senegal mm -hmm. about the need to transform uh, the value chain and all that. And mm -hmm. so I wanted to, to you know, just, just make, sure, make sure that uh, his point on, on that. And even it's actually linked up with Stephen is carrying his point about the, the legal identity. You, 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 you know, very, very important line running through that. And I think that data ownership is very important in, in that regard. I, I see what, thank you very much for that. Um, I see what you are saying. I'm going to encourage people as you come, if you do have questions and you have a perspective, I'm going to try to tap into it. Because I think it's important for us to be as collaborative and share as much as possible. Um, so, sir, I come to you now. Thank you. Merci encore. Thank you once again, moderator. My name is Abbas. I'm director of uh, trade for the Comoros Islands. I listen carefully to all of your brilliant uh, presentations. And uh, I've striven to understand what's been happening in terms of the continental free trade area. And I'd like to talk about the African economic community. I see that you talk a lot about uh, e-commerce and uh, digital trade, as I understand it. And my question is the following. Given the existence of all the original regional blocks in the continent, have you carried out uh, a current overview so we can really briefly understand what each block is doing. I wonder if you've harmonized what is happening across the continent at present. As we move towards a continental free trade area. I'd also like to know 
whether you have carried out an impact study at regional level or at continental level. So we have the tripartite uh, free trade area and the continental free trade area. And my last question is whether you've taken into account whether you've taken into account the aspects of peace and security at African level. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Three, three in one, but we'll try to we'll try to get them down. I'll take two from this side and two from this. La the lady over here. Thank you. Um, go ahead, please. Ma okay. Um, thank you very much, Julie, with your most able and um, knowledgeable panel. My names are Juliana Mumo Kisimbi. I am from Kenya. I have one question and three comments. My question is, I to the gentleman who is the consultant. Sorry, I didn't get your name. Mr. Hussein? Yes, Mr. Yeah. Hussein. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bishan, okay. Um, how are you ensuring that Africa does not become an experimental ground for in a, in a, not inefficient, but unfinished uh, e-commerce products because we find that you can install a system now, and in six months, you say that it's, we, we have a new version. We have an improved version. They cost money. These are bilateral and international treaties. So we don't want Africa then to become a dumping ground for unfinished products in mm -hmm. terms of technology. Okay. The and other yes. three comments that I have to propose is one, to the system that you create expandable systems that, uh, that can adopt to new versions, like an update, the way we do to Windows or to, um, uh, I think, uh, antivirus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then um, basically, to, to that they're, because they're expensive, you install, you, you build capacity, you train. Mm -hmm. then, and, and there are resources, this is taxpayer money. The other thing, number th that's the, the, my second comment, is that uh, the adaptability of countries. Some adapt faster, others adapt slower. So how are you going to ensure, like Julie just said, when you cross together, you're unlikely to be eaten by the crocodile. Mm -hmm. So how do we bring everybody together, especially where we have issues of language barrier, and all the other uh, uh, protectionism of countries. How then do we break that barrier to ensure that everybody comes on board at the same time? Right. And my last suggestion uh, is the uh, we need to prioritize the products because we already have approved list of products, especially for the Agoa market and mm -hmm. also in the existing um, trading blocks, Comessa, ECOWAS, SADAC, and East Africa. So then, those are the products that should be given priority to go on the list of the system. And so, so that, and then again, because we have to address the issue of harmonization and standardization. Right. So right. that then we don't start saying, oh, this one can come in, this one has to go out. We so you're saying this, this is a complex process and contributing quite a bit to, to the thought process behind the planning. That, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, I want to go right at the back. There was a hand there, but it's not up anymore. So the, the lady right here. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Lydia. I will come back. Thank you. Go ahead. Sorry. My name is Lydia Macau. I represent the e-commerce foundation in Kenya with the Global E-commerce uh, Trust Mark. Um, I would like to commend the Director General for Universal uh, Postal Union, um, Mr. Bashir, for the e-com initiative. Uh, it seems to me like it offers the opportunity for Africa to get the single uh, digital market uh, that mm -hmm. it needs. Um, at the moment, there are, there are two main challenges that are, that are facing um, MSMEs in Africa. One, like you said, is the visibility of their businesses, and the other is basically trade logistics. The cost of transport, the cost of shipment is very high. Um, with regard to visibility, one of the opportunities that is available right now for MSMEs 
is to list in um, e-commerce platforms. Um, the challenge is that they are really expensive. They are really expensive. Um, and then um, if, 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 if someone wants to ship, say an SME wants to ship, say a, a pair of sandals from, from Kenya to the US, um, the cost of shipment is so high, mm -hmm. it's, it's probably about three times or four times the cost of that, the price of that item here. And if you add the, the, the cost of listing on, a, on an e-commerce plus platform and you add duties, by the time that product gets to the US, it will cost about five to six times the local price. I mean, it basically renters that product uncompetitive. Mm. And as Africa, we, 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 we need to encourage uh, exports uh, so that we are not just uh, consuming what is available in the e-commerce space from, from other markets. So Thank my you. question to uh, Mr. Bashir is, with the Ecom uh, Africa project, can we expect uh, can, we, can we expect the Ecom Africa project to provide a solution to these challenges? Um, you know, can we expect to see uh, a reduction in the cost of, of, of shipment Thank for you. goods coming out of Africa? Thank you to very the rest much. Of the world. And, and yeah. let me just, and I'll come to this side in a moment. Let me just uh, highlight something that we need to touch on a little bit more when it, when it comes to pricing of African products. Um, over my career, I, I've worked on several different projects, and we actually realized that in Africa we have a major problem with pricing because uh, small uh, scale businessmen and women don't understand how to best value their time. And so they price themselves down. So a lot of times, even when you say the cost of, 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 of uh, sending the product out is more than the cost of the product, that's already because the first problem was we undervalued ourselves. And we priced ourselves right down here, which keeps us locked into this cycle. And so even as we have these discussions, this is not the focal point of the discussion we're having right now, but I want to red flag this issue as an important issue to take up, is how do we curate and value the products that are coming out of Africa? Very important. Okay, um, let me go to the back. So I will take a um, gentleman over there and the lady over here. Thank you. So we'll start with you, sir. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Arthur Gwagwa. I'm a senior research fellow at uh, the Center for Intellectual Property. Move closer Strath to the mic, please. Strathmore University. Thank you. Um, my question is directed to the gentleman from UNECA. Uh -huh. um, I, I know they, uh, we, we all know that you know, digital identity is good for the economy, but there are also negative uh, implications like you know, facial recognition technology that is being imported from China. So far we know that only Zimbabwe has signed a contract with China. But there hasn't really been any transparency regarding which other African countries have so far signed those deals. And also given China's bad uh, human rights record, and some of these countries where these technologies are being deployed, where there's limited rule of law, what sort of, you know, um, what sort of uh, mechanisms are being put in place to ensure that you know, data that is being stored, data analytics and digital identifiers are not being uh, used to the detriment of, of the citizens? I'll, I'll bring that to you and Stephen in a moment. I'll take the lady here and then we'll come back to the panel. Yes, go ahead. Um, thank you very much. My name is uh, Kamati Mugala. I'm the Executive Secretary of the East Africa Trade Union Confederation. I'm also here on behalf of the International Trade Union Confederation of Africa, representing 16 million workers across 51 partner states of Africa. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm bringing the people's perspective in this discussion because I feel uh, it, has not dis uh, it has not been highlighted uh, uh, since uh, the beginning of the discussion. As the trade unions, we realize and we understand that digital industrialization policies are essential to promote future of decent jobs, considering unemployment in Africa and also considering the, uh, the large informality in Africa. But uh, just hearing uh, the, the, the panels from uh, yesterday, today morning, and now, 
I ask myself, would it be not suicidal to simply undertake integration with uh, global di digitalized, di digitalized systems? Um, integration, w sorry, will it, will, it, will it not be suicidal to simply undertake integration with global digi digitalized systems? I'm saying this because I'm Will it not be suicidal? Yes. Mm -hmm. Because I'm, I'm looking at this, also looking at our startups, I'm looking at our infant industries, I'm looking, um, are they ready to take up the market and compete with the already industrialized countries in terms of development within the digital industry? So are you advocating for protectionism? Yes. And I'm picking an example from India. And I'm following up the discussions that are happening at the, at the level of the WTO that I've not had uh, uh, also people discuss in terms of the e-commerce so, discussion so at the WTO. Thank you. Just to be clear, you're saying Africa should be protectionist. So we should have intra-Africa cooperation and trade, but we should be maybe protectionist about the rest of the world. Is that? Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Let me let me bring that <laughs> let me bring that to the panel. Very very interesting. Maybe Stephen, I'll start with you on this end. And you had a, a, a question for you on 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 digital uh, identity. And and St I think Arthur was saying you know there are negative implications as well. He's made some comments about China, which I'll refrain from going into. But ask for your perspective on on what he has shared, and maybe perhaps you can give him some clarity on other other African countries that are in the position that Zimbabwe is in right now, and what. What's your opinion on that? Thank you very much, uh, Jury, and um, thank you for the various questions. Actually, in fact, the the, the, the question from Comoros mm -hmm. um, also required. Going answers. to come to that so, one as so well. Should I go first? I'll start with him, and I'll bring you to okay, Comoros, okay. So, and so back let, to back to protectionism. Okay, thank you. So <laughs> let me go first of all thank to you. the issue of the. Um, of the digital IDs and the issues of um, behavior of governments. Now, and to say that this is why it's important that uh, the Economic Commission for Africa is actually at this pace. Mm -hmm. um, we are here and promoting this idea because we want, at the end of the day, to urge for cooperation among African countries so that we can actually have an ID systems that at least adheres to some principles. And some of these principles are touch on the issues that uh, the question is alluding to. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that at the end of the day, governments don't find themselves locked into technology whereby if they want to change something, they have to pay a phenomenal amount of money to be able to do that. Right. We also to also have um, an ID system framework whereby some of the, a lot of African uh, young people can actually be able to develop the, the softwares and the support system for these ID systems within here, within, within here. I mean, in South Africa, you can manufacture the chips that you need for ID systems. Mm -hmm. So that's why the ECA finds it a very important uh, part for us to be involved in, so that we can work towards ensuring that we do not have those things that make the citizens worried. Of course, some of the other principles that should be part of this framework are issues of data protection, mm -hmm. data security, right. where is all this data uh, stored? Is right. it within Africa or by the providers of the technology? We want to make sure that all these issues are addressed. Right. Now, then there was a question about... Um, Yes, from Comoros, we were asked about, given the existence of regional blocks, yes. you know, have you carried out an urgent overview to understand what each block is, is doing? He asks, yeah. have you carried out an impact assessment at regional or continental level? Are we taking into account peace and security? So. Now, thank you very much also for this question. In fact, uh, when I look around the room, I actually see some of our negotiators here. Uh, and so I'm sure they are listening very carefully because I can see some of our member states negotiators for the CFTA okay. in the room. But first of all, to say that uh, on the issue of the regional economic communities versus the African continent of free trade area, one of the agreed principles is that uh, the 
AFCFTA builds on their key of what has already been achieved mm -hmm. in the regional economic communities. So we are building on the successes of the regional economic communities. And we can go into the details of what, what that means. As to whether we have done impact analysis of what the CFTA is about, actually we've been studying this for the last 10 years. Um, to the point that as recent as this year, now that the countries, the member states, or the state parties to the CFTA have agreed on the modalities mm -hmm. and the options of how to go about with this, to implement these modalities, we have done an analysis of what this means for the continent, for the different countries, for the different sectors, and what I can tell you is that what these results are showing is that we are going to have an increase in intra-African trade, and most of that increase is going to be in the value-added goods. But much more importantly, the analysis also shows that the higher the ambition of our continental free trade area and the speed at which we implement it, the better it is for everyone and especially for the small economies. Just before I leave yeah, you, yeah. because I will move to the other panelists, protectionism and Africa. Well, Africa need not be protectionist. Um, what Africa needs to do is to have a clear, strategic, sequenced policy approach to the way it does things. What do I mean by this? I've just said that we trade more on value-added goods. Mm. I have said that if we are ambitious and we are rapid in the implement ratification and the implementation of the continental free trade area, it is better for us. Now, the CFT is going to help us develop regional value chains. Now, we need these regional value chains to be able to enter the global value chain. So if we do what is expected of us, and that is where e-commerce comes into play because now we include everybody who needs to be part and benefit, bene, benefactor of the CFTA, mm -hmm. then we will actually be able, in a sequenced approach, to be able to compete uh, globally. The biggest problem our SMEs and small companies have, or the farms have, is that they cannot actually compete globally because they have not even utilized the local and the regional platform right. to learn and even to innovate. Okay. And the CFTA is giving us this opportunity. Thank you, thank you. Uh, l l let, me, let me come to you next, Ethel. And, and you know, quite a lot of comments, no direct questions to you, but was there anything that caught your attention there? And perhaps do you have an, a perspective on protectionism? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a, I'm a proponent of just in the, the, the Africa technology ecosystem of Africa building and solving its problems within, mm -hmm. right? That does not necessarily mean that I necessarily believe in protectionism, but I do think that um, just in general in the tech ecosystem, the problems that are being solved are really specific to Africa, right? Mm -hmm. So even if you look at the fintech plays, they're really specific to the issues that we, the problems we have in Africa. If you look at... Um, uh, projects like MCOPA, which is uh, solar-powered, uh, on-demand, or if you look at Twiga, which is um, a B2B e-commerce play, all these ones are actually um, helping to, to find paths to solve the problems that, you know, there's a lot of uh, things around agri-tech, mm -hmm. where e-commerce is actually becoming a really big play to make sure that the uh, um, the farmers, the smallholder farmers, can get access to markets in a simple, in simpler and easier way. Right. Um, and so from that perspective, I really do believe that, that the startups and the, the companies that are being built within the continent need, really need to concentrate on building to solve the things in the continent because right. as uh, Nigerian fintech players like fintech and Flutterways have shown that you can't make money solving problems on the continent. Thank you. Um, but I think that there is always a, a pushback if you, do, if you do that with the outside world means how do we survive if once we start protectionism when, um, where there is a blowback there. That's just my, my, my only issues there. And, and this conversation about the data and, and who owns data with sort of all the silos. It's a really tough, that's a really, really <laughs> tough space. Um, if you look at it just from solely from the fact that um, 
ease of use for startups and the tech ecosystems. It's interesting that it's a great idea that we can host where, just, just in terms of infrastructure, right? So having the, the service infrastructure that enables you to actually run and run well, you're most likely have to go outside the continent. There are very few players in the continent that are strong um, sort of data centers, right? So that's, that's the problem for sort of companies going into the space, but I also understand it from the government side of, listen, if we're collecting information about uh, our, uh, the people that are in our, that data that which can be exploited and used in many ways right. uh, from a government perspective, it's like, well, I'd rather it be in my borders. I, I don't know that I have an answer for that. Just It's, it's a complex it's a, one. Yeah, it's a complex one that needs to be looked into and, and discussed a bit further. Thank you very much. So Hussein, I, I come to you now, and the first question that was for you was on data ownership and your perspective. Well, um, well, thank you very much uh, for the question. Uh, the data ownership, the Universal Postal Union, first of all, is an organization that uh, uh, prides itself as one of the big data uh, ownership organizations in the world. So all our transactions, wherever they are in the world, are captured on a daily basis in my office in the headquarters in, in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. So we own those data ourselves, and uh, we are a trusted organization. Therefore, we do not uh, disclose or uh, give information at will about uh, country's data. The other question I think which she wants to, uh, I mean, which uh, Madame has asked is mm -hmm. about technology. How sure that we are not going to be dumped with technology, and for a short while, then uh, the system becomes obsolete, and then it's very expensive. I think that's, the, that's more or less the, the, the line of question. Frankly speaking, uh, technology is moving so fast. Africa should not be behind technology. We must adapt to the latest technology. We should not be left behind in technology. That's the one thing. However, the UPU has one of the finest, the best in the class IT uh, specialists uh, who handle all this information and data for us. And when we are setting this platform, this is not a uh, rocket science. There are other organizations who have already established uh, ICT platforms, uh, digital market platforms, uh, many of them I can mention here, who we just go and cut and paste. We all need, need to do is just to come here and uh, uh, adjust them to our requirements in this place. And the experts will be able to do that. So I don't fear, um, I don't have any query. Uh, again, one other thing is that um, uh, in terms of security, we have got what's uh, the top, uh, what's called um, dot post is an ICANN top-level domain for secure uh, transmission of our data. So mm -hmm. we are not worried about security issues as far as that part is concerned. Mm -hmm. I had another question from uh, uh, Lydia there uh, asking me about uh, uh, how uh, uh, she, she was concerned about the, the cost of shipment, mm -hmm. which is too expensive uh, ordinarily when people ship their goods. Well, we are in a competitive market, and uh, you can be sure that the postal network worldwide are well priced. And not only that, we don't have hidden costs. All our prices are published. We know the transportation costs. We know the delivery costs in the countries of destinations. We do this every day. So before you can even ship your goods, then you'll be able to get a clear and transparent pricing system. And I can tell you we are, we are better than many other uh, companies that ship things abroad. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Anna, let, let me come to you now. There were many um, comments, thoughts, questions, very, very interesting contributions. Um, uh, what, what are your thoughts on, on some of the thoughts that have been shared? Well, I mean, I think not, not specifically from the customs angle, but I think the issue of um, where data is located and where data is stored is a, a concern of the entire world. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's a very important and sensitive topic that is being discussed in many, many, many fora, and, and certainly with regards to bilateral engagements with, between different countries, what some of the concerns are, in fact, where is the data going to be stored and how is it going to be managed? So it, it is a, a very important topic, and mm -hmm. and I think it isn't one that is 
that is only uh, an African issue. So I, I think in that regard, it's important to to note that, that Africa is in the same boat as everybody else, that, that it is a, a, a very big issue, something that, that does need to be um, well well uh, researched and well informed, and, and that the people who are, who are negotiating or, or being involved in, in some of these uh, free trade agreements, whether they be continental or, or um, outside of the continent, that there will be some, some experts that understand uh, data localization and, and some of the, the policies um, around that. So very, very interesting topic. And I think it's very fluid still right yes. now. Things changing very fast and, and, and norms and standards still being created uh, as we move along. Daniel, your thoughts? on the comments and the questions that have come in. Just one minute, sorry. Uh, just one related to the, um, uh, the personal data, mm -hmm. the security of this data, uh, I think it's a very serious issue that we have to, to address in Africa because we're in a situation where data collection is nascent in Africa today. And uh, I think it goes faster, very fast, faster than the regulation yeah. capacity to define how this data can be used and how the, uh, uh, the customer or the individual or the person can be, can be protected against that. And it's not only a question of, uh, let's say, ethic. We can say that the data is owned by the, everyone, uh, the customer. It's a way the question of technology as well. So where are we going to store this data is a very, very serious question. Mm -hmm. And when uh, you are talking about who, I mean, normally if, I'm in a private, private sector, but if, let's say, an investor coming from America or from China goes to invest in my company, certainly I will have a strong discussion with him about where the data will be stored. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, as they tell mention it, uh, keeping the data in the country, in some countries, can be very, very risky. So I, I don't have a response to that. Right. Uh, the way we are addressing it in our case is to spread this data across the cloud so that you cannot <laughs> exactly, myself, I don't exactly know where they are, mm. to be frank. But, but, I mean, it's a very, very serious issue. Yeah. I think uh, as far as we will connect to collect data, and probably you address this issue, uh, you send, in your case, but as far as we collect data, the risk that this data has been used by the public or by the private sector in the wrong way, and we have many, many examples. Or by government in the wrong way. It's very, very serious. <laughs> right. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you for that. Um, Claire, your thoughts? Yes, also about uh, around data because mm -hmm. it's a <laughs> it's an issue that is really underpins the entire um, uh, digital economy. Um, first, I think we all agree. I hope we all agree by now that uh, you know the slogan uh, "data is the new oil" uh, is totally misleading because uh, data is not a finite resource. It is, uh, you know, it, it keeps expanding. Um, I think the, uh, and so I think the better metaphor is data is like, um, is like blood. It really, you know, permeates uh, 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 the entire economy. Um, we have mentioned uh, the issue of localization, uh, where data should be located. Mm -hmm. Another major issue is going to be that, is that actually a, a fragmentation of data? Uh, because we all know that, uh, that uh, the you know, um, uh, digital economy is powered by big data, and what we are seeing in most of the countries is that data is totally fragmented. And, so, and, and if you don't bring it together, you are not going to have that, uh, you know, that, uh, that uh, transformative, uh, um, um, uh, 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 you, you cannot use it in, in transformational uh, manners. So I think actually the panel, the high-level panel, is going to make uh, this is going to be a major area of focus data uh, mm -hmm. and how to um, uh, treat in certain cases data as a global public good right. um, at local, national uh, or international level. Probably it's not, it's not the you know, uh, one, one, one size fits all, but that's, you know, th there's going to be certainly some, uh, some uh, interesting proposals uh, uh, coming, uh, uh, coming out uh, of the panel on that one. So watch that space. Thank you very much for that. I'm going to take one more round of questions um, and then come back to the panel. So I'll take the gentleman at the front and the lady in red at the back. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. My name is Huni uh, Abule Basinoka from Nigeria. I represent the 37 million 
medium and small scale enterprises that engages or employ over 57 million Nigerians. So our concern from though the Secretary General is off, but in his presentation he was clear that this should also be tackled from a development uh, mm -hmm. point of view. Mm -hmm. And if that is the case, our question is, if e-commerce for development is the agenda, why do we need to put this in WTO negotiation? And we are recommending as part of the outcome of this forum that e-commerce should not be negotiated in WTO. Secondly, to the custom lady, uh, within the context of this forum, how do we deal with the issue of uh, de minimis uh, threshold? Because it is a concern that if we are doing e-commerce, do we leave the whole world wide open for Africa? Or we need to fix some uh, de minimis threshold so that we can uh, know where to take off from? And then finally... Please, uh, please, sir. Okay. What is the de minimis threshold? How many people know? I say there are no stupid questions. I always say that. How many people know the de minimis threshold? Okay, I'm not the only one who doesn't know. So explain to us in the simplest terms. <laughs> I, I <laughs> what think, does that I, mean? <laughs> I, I think uh, she, will, she, she will also deal with that anyway. Okay, okay. Uh, because we are, we are talking three, so we also, we are, we also okay, permit us to use the technical uh, terms there. And then finally, is um, everybody talks about government. Mm -hmm. And there is a disconnect in our conversation here this afternoon. Mm -hmm. We say government should come up with an agenda to either educate citizens or protect citizens. And it is in the same government that the drivers of e-commerce don't want regulation. Government cannot support a private sector-led process without their powers to regulate that system. And that brings us to where we demand, as part of the outcome, that Africa is also interested in data localization or cross-border flow of our data. It is something we treasure. It's something we also want to sell and also make money in the process. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yes, go ahead. No, the lady, sorry, sir, it was the lady behind Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. <laughs> um, I wanted to comment, my name is Rachel Inaina. Uh, I work for Film Village of Kenya. And uh, first, I wanted to tell the entrepreneurs who are building the technology, please build a technology for film distribution because uh, mm -hmm. we've, we've seen a very good uh, case example with Netflix, where they are actually, we are actually watching Netflix in Africa, mm -hmm. and yet we have our own content that we want to put out there. So I have made uh, uh, various observations that I want to share. For example, about small beginnings. Now we have these uh, entrepreneurs, and this is to the entrepreneurs, who are making uh, uh, e-commerce platforms. Before we talk about Africa, like let's say in Kenya we have 47 counties. Have you been able to cover the 47 counties with your e-commerce business? Have you been able to reach out to each and uh, so can we trade within ourselves as a country first so that we can trade with the rest of Africa? And then the other question I also wanted to say is um, to the government, uh, how can we access industry condition papers like, for example, I'm a filmmaker. I want to, to be able to access all these papers online so that I'm able to make my business decisions. Mm -hmm. How can we access such papers? Mm -hmm. How can we access papers like Vision 2030, the SDGs? Where hold up, hold up, hold on. Africa 2063. Have you tried to Google some of these documents? Yes, yes. Have you found Afri Agenda 2063 yes, online? Yes, Have you found Vision 2030 online? Yeah, but... Uh, it's not comprehensive what you get online. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we want to get all that, uh, doc all those documents. Where are they? How can can the government share information with the citizen? Mm -hmm. So so we are able to do business. And then I also feel that uh, we are leaving out a very major stakeholder in this discussion, mm -hmm. who are the users of the internet. Mm -hmm. We don't have them on our panels. We don't know what their needs are. We, we've not had what they want, and yet those are the customers who, who should be talking about it. Mm -hmm. And then the other part of the, of the thing is the attitude. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a lot of youth on social media every day, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. 
but they're not using uh, these platforms to, to do business. So mm -hmm. the attitude, what are we doing about the people, the people, because they're the most important component of this whole business, because it's okay. people who are doing business. Before I leave you on that one, yes. what do you propose we do about the people? I think that uh, we need to invest more in uh, training, training the users, on how they can use the social, the, the, the digital platforms to also enhance their businesses. I think that's a very important thing. Thank and you. also make them a priority, research from them, ask them what they want. Like for example, I, I've, not, I've not seen someone who sells things or on Jumia or buys things on Jumia speak on the panel and tell us what challenges do they face. So we are speaking for them, okay. yet the product is for them. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, although what, what you will notice with markets is that people will go where it works. People will avoid what doesn't work. And in, in many ways, that, that, that tells you the story. But I do want to tap into what you've brought up. I'm coming to this side in a moment. I do want to tap into what you've brought up about mindset because it is important. And the reason why you said you want access to government papers, and I asked you, I made it a point to ask you, have you looked? is because I, 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 like maybe many others in this room, engage on social media. I have a very heavy following. If I post content that is related to opportunity and development in a continent where young people are hungry for opportunity, or so we are told, I get very little feedback. I will take a selfie smiling and make a silly comment like, you know, beautiful day or having fun or let's play, and I will get thousands upon thousands of likes and so as we talk about engaging these people my question is yes but how do we help you if you are not ready to help yourself and maybe this is mindset maybe it starts in school but it's a conversation we really must all have there is a gap there is a problem sir your hand has been i see you i come to you first and then to the lady here and i'll try to come to the back go ahead please I see you. I see you now. Okay. I see you now. Okay. We will get there. We will get there. Okay. Go Bonjour. Bonjour. Good afternoon. My name is Kobiet Ettagnel, and I'm from Burkina Faso. And before beginning, I would like to inform you that today Burkina Faso is celebrating the anniversary of its independence. Perhaps we could have a round of applause for that. <laughs> My question is to Mr. Bisha, considering the platform and the those who are involved in e-commerce, my fear is with, will this platform not be a screen for the SMEs who work in the area? We have seen these platforms are often larger firms behind because they are able to hire the bandwidth and hire the publicity and they put the SMEs forward as if they are the ones sponsoring the publicity. That's my fear. And another point I'd like to make concerns trust. We spoke about trust with the solution that was proposed by the speaker for digital commerce. Perhaps we could have an African certification system, a, a company that works in the e-commerce that provides certification so that those who have the right labeling are submitted to various regulations which they must respect and once they've done so they could receive a certificate to allow them to work in this area and that would provide more trust if those companies are certified and also this certification we would require to have money to have these certificates but if it takes place that could have a negative effect on the SMEs so the companies that's my contribution, but my first question is to Monsieur Michel. Merci. 
Thank you. So I just want to be clear. Should we have certification or not? What do you think? Because are you saying that it could impact negatively also on the SMEs because they may not have the capacity to, 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 to get certified because it may cost? So you're saying there are pros and cons of certification? No. No. Okay. no. Certification would be useful if it was made free but the SMEs should be able to fulfill various criteria in order to be able to have these certificates. Their systems should be properly set out. All of that should be set in place. And then the certificates could be issued. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the lady? Yes. OK. Thank you very much. But you will need your interpretation material also. I will speak in, in French. Mm -hmm for me to make sure that I will go for my idea. Mm -hmm. uh, merci. Thank you very much. Since yesterday, we've been listening to some discussions on e-commerce, but the issue is what will Africa be able to trade in? What will our African countries be able to market when we have set up all of this infrastructure that's required, once we've developed all of the platforms that we require, once we've provided capacity building for our entrepreneurs. What are we actually going to be trading in? I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that we must look at, when we speak about e-commerce, we should look at the production that we have, the processing, the manufacturing in Africa, and also the labeling of these, the standardization, so that these products can go across the different borders between our countries and also beyond Africa. Otherwise, what could happen is that our investment in such infrastructure, in these platforms, in capacity building, and all that we will have done will be only a way of preparing the ground for being consumers of products from outside Africa. Let me not cite countries. We are used to the to the fact that this sometimes happens and there there won't be any development in the e-commerce and from the ministry from then and as we continue the conversations that we are talking about an African market for African trade of African products when we talk about a single African digital market and there may be points where other products are coming in and, and they're part of the trade however right now this I believe is, is the focus for Africa and so um, you know I, 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 I really want to point out when you look at production manufacturing labeling so very important but let's all keep in mind that we are not talking about trading products that have come from outside because we already do that and we do that so well we are trying to trade our African products. Yeah? Yes, we are talking about African products, Excellent. but we have to focus on African product quality yes. to make sure that African will consume African products. Okay. Is Thank that you. my point? Thank you very much. Um, allow me as I go to this side of the room now to say that Please let us not assume they're not excellent African products out there because they are. And um, what is the chili that comes from Rwanda called? Akavanga. We'll sell in Nigeria like mad. And we just have to open our eyes in each of our spaces to find excellent, outstanding products, and we need to build more. But I'm, I'm hesitant for us to kind of accept that we don't have any. We do have. We do have some. We need to do more, however. We need to do more, and that point is taken. I'll come to the lady at the front here, and then the gentleman right at the back. Are you ready? In a, in a moment, yes. In, in The gentleman in white right at the back, yes, with your hand up. Uh, please start us off. Thank you very much. I'm Sanya Reed-Smith, a trade lawyer at Third World Network. My question is to Director Karingi, uh, because when you said that we need to protect inventions of startups via the CFTA's intellectual property provisions, was you and ECA suggesting that all African countries should grant patents, even though the African WTO members who are least developed countries have a transition period until they graduate from being LDCs before they have to grant patents on anything and nine African countries haven't even joined the WTO so don't have to give
give patents on anything yet until they join. And even though we know, for example, that patents on HIV AIDS medicines meant they were $15,000 per patient per year, but when there were no patents, LDCs in Africa could import them for $67 per patient per year, the generic version. So people were dying because they couldn't afford life-saving medicines because they were patented. So the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health has recommended that least developed countries, including Africa, should make full use of the transition period not to have patents until they graduate from being LDC. So are you recommending the opposite of that other United Nations body? And my question to Director Hino Joseph from the WCO is what has been your experience of countries which raise the de minimis, below which imports come in tariff-free? The reason I ask is because at the WTO and e-commerce proposals, the US is saying that everybody should raise the de minimis, including least developed countries in Africa, presumably to the US level, which is 800 US dollars. So everything below that comes in tariff-free. But countries like Ghana have $2 de minimises. So to go from $2 to 800 would mean a huge surge in imports, and also 24% of Ghana's government revenue comes from tariffs. So we know that for low-income countries, which is 28 African countries, according to the International Monetary Fund economists, at best they make back 30% of this lost tariff revenue, for example, because they raise the de minimis, even if they introduce a value-added tax. Whereas the rest of Africa, except Seychelles, of course, are middle-income countries, and the IMF says at best you make back 45 to 60% of your lost tariff revenue, for example, when you raise the de minimis. And there are four other ways that the WTO e-commerce proposals would reduce tax revenue, which means cuts to public services, which according to UNCTAD impacts women disproportionately. So this may be one of the reasons why the Africa group in the WTO have rejected e-commerce negotiations in the WTO, and you can see that on their statements at the entrance to the room here, which are in French and English. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, go ahead, sir. We, we can't hear. Please switch it on. I will speak in French. That's fine. Okay. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> no. Merci. Thank you. Good afternoon to you all. I'm a promoter of the platform of Libre Faso. The glasses. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Go. Promoter for the Libre Faso platform in Burkina Faso. As far as promotion is concerned of our products, specifically African ones, this is a reality because we were able to make our Burkina Faso products exclusive from the beginning of this year. We only sell local products from Burkina Faso and you will find these products there. That said, the real problem we're facing for e-commerce in our countries, specifically, we can say this since we've been testing it for the last year, is the means of payment. It's true that mobile penetration is very high, but as far as payment is concerned in Burkina, we have no problem. We have two principal operators, Mobicash and Orange, which allow us to make payments through our telephone services. It's not paid directly on the site. It's paid at the time of delivery, a bit like the Jumia model, paid at the time of delivery. But the real problem is that the products that we have on our platform are products which interest the diaspora from Burkina. And they want to try and find these. They can't find them in Europe or in US or elsewhere. And therefore, the other problem, and I'm coming to this, and here I'd like to ask some advice on how we can resolve it. When you go to our platform, the administration of our platform cannot integrate any African accounts for operators for PayPal, which is very well known by Americans, by the Europeans, who use it very often. So when you try to set up a PayPal bank account, it doesn't accept it. It just shuts down. So we have found that this is something that we really need to resolve so that we're able to sell to the diaspora and to people in the US. When we speak about e-commerce for African products, therefore, we can sell them amongst us at our country level or on the continent, but we should be able to also send our products to another continent here in this room do we have a solution to offer to resolve this issue with the large 
operators such as PayPal. Is there a specific solution to that? Please, could it be shared with us so that we are able to use it? Thank you. Thank you for that. I think gentleman from the AU. Yes, go ahead. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Moderator. Mm -hmm. My name is Christian. As you said, uh, I'm representing AU Commission in this meeting. I don't want to, re to respond uh, to Burkina Faso re representative, but I uh, would like to make a comment on uh, Ambassador Hussein's uh, presentation, and I will be continuing in uh, French. So allow me. Alors, uh, Monsieur le Directeur Général. And Director General of UPU, you mentioned calling upon partnerships so that the projects can be used to aid African countries to take advantage of e-commerce. And I think perhaps he forgot the fact that the African Union is a stakeholder in that initiative that he presented so well. And to wit, the minister in charge of the infrastructure, which are essential to the growth of e-commerce, the ministers have already approved a project to improve connectivity for the postal unions across our countries and many African countries have committed to a pilot phase that should lead to those countries improving their infrastructure for postal services across the whole of their country. And in the same vein, I would like to announce here to the distinguished participants here that the Euro African Union following this meeting is hoping to organize at the end of February 2019 a forum which will bring together many of the people here present to focus on how African postal services can contribute in an efficient manner to the growth in a harmonious manner of e-commerce. And that was the contribution I wanted to make at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. You added a lot of value. We bring these now back to the panel um, as we come to the really the final session, really, uh, uh, with the panel. So uh, maybe, Anna, I'll, I'll begin with you, because you did get some uh, direct questions, I think. Um, how do, do we deal with the issue of the de minimis threshold? And for those who are not familiar with it, what is it? and maybe take us through your thoughts um, on the question posed. Okay, perfectly. And actually, there were two questions on that, but yes, yes I'll, ahead, please. I'll, yes. I'll handle them together. Right. Thank you very much for the questions. Um, the, the de minimis threshold is a, is a concept that is uh, captured in a convention of the World Customs Organization that is called the Revised Kyoto Convention. This particular provision, what it calls for is for governments customs administrations, but really governments, to set a threshold um, where they do an analysis of what it costs them to collect money. And so what is that break-even point where if you're going to collect, for example, $20, but it's going to cost you $25, it doesn't make sense to spend $25 to collect $20. I don't know if, if that's mm. clear. Mm -hmm. So governments are uh, requested to do an analysis of what it actually costs them to process a collection. And based on that analysis, they're to set a threshold um, that would allow them to say it's not cost effective for us to, to collect this money, so anything below this threshold um, comes in without duties paid, without taxes paid, and without, um, without any customs formalities. So that threshold really is almost a free pass to come into the, to the country because it's, it, the, the concept is it's not cost effective for the, for the customs administration to make that collection. That sounds very simple. Um, the, the calculations are uh, really need to be done on a country by country basis. So uh, the, the cost of collecting is different in Nigeria versus Kenya versus Ghana versus um, whatever other country. So every country really needs to do uh, an economic assessment to make the determination of what that break even point is and, and um, make that assessment. Um, the, touching on the issue that uh, Sonia brought up, 
uh, on, you know, why is the United States at 800, and and why are they pushing so hard to have other countries um, <clears throat> raise their their de minimis threshold level? I can't. I'm not speaking for the United States, but one thing that I I do need to to be very clear about is that the the um, situation in the United States is very different from practically every other country in the world. And the reason that it's different is that the United States does not collect VAT or GST on imports. Um, the, the tax assessments are done on a domestic level based on sales that take place within the United States. So, so collection of taxes, and whether it be GST or VAT, do not apply at time of importation. So the only thing that the United States is, is calculating in its uh, assessment of what their break point, what their break even point is, is the issue of import duties. And import duties in the United States, based on the fact that they have so many uh, free trade agreements with so many countries, are very low. And over the course of the last three decades, the United States has been on a, on a trajectory of de-tarification, which means reducing the, the tariffs. So it takes a lot of value to equal um, the, the, the break-even threshold for the United States, um, because all they're calculating is the duty consequences. And again, the duty consequences in the United States are relatively low. Uh, again, because of free trade agreements and because their duty rates have gone down quite a bit. So it's a very different situation than what most countries around the world have. Right. Um, we are seeing um, kind of a reverse process going on uh, around the world. Uh, in particular, for example, the EU has just recently announced that they, although will maintain a, a de minimis threshold level of, I believe, is 22 euros, um, that is only for duties. For VAT, their threshold level is zero, which, which means that everything coming into Europe will be assessed a VAT. So they do have a threshold for duties, but not for VAT. We see other countries like Australia and, and others that have seen, um, that are seeing uh, a great um, disruption of their, of their trade practices where, where uh, many uh, companies are now, or ma many of their imports are coming in via, via uh, e-commerce. So, so that they can come in underneath the, the de minimis threshold. And what it's doing for a lot of the domestic retailers, it's really giving them a disadvantage right. because the domestic retailers are importing them, paying duties and taxes, and so they have to sell them at the price that includes those duties and taxes versus when the customers order them from overseas and bring them in directly, they can get them at a cheaper price, which means that people aren't going to buy, buy them domestically. So these are some of the challenges that, that some of the, some of the uh, countries are facing and are, are having to take into consideration when looking at what to do with regards to the de minimis thresholds. Right, and you know, it's very technical for some of us. Uh, Sorry. But, but no, 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 <laughs> apologies. We're learning, we're learning new things. Um, what would you advise Africa very briefly as we're looking at this single digital market with respect to the de minimis threshold? So I, I do think that it, it, it does need to be uh, an economic evaluation. Um, and taking in into consideration all of the costs that, that are uh, potentially associated with, with collection mm -hmm. um, to, to, to figure out what that right level is. And it shouldn't be what one country says it should be or, or what a different country says it should be. It really needs to be, unfortunately, only that country can, can, can really articulate what its costs are. Okay. Um, I, I, I know that um, Mr. Hussein spoke about how they, the, the Postal Service um, publishes its rates uh, across the world. That is, that is a different dynamic, and when they do the economic assessments, and I'm sure there's a lot of Study. economists and studies that go into, into calculating that, they, 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 do, uh, they take all of the costs around the world and, and, and factor that in. Here, each country needs to make that determination, right. and those costs need to be very 
very country specific. Okay. What that happens within within a continental free trade agreement, that's something that I can't speak to, but but that would be certainly something that you would want to really discuss and see what makes sense for for Africa. Thank you so much for that. And so it brings me to you, Stephen. <laughs> what does this mean for our CFTA? But also you had a couple of other questions. Um, why do we need this in WTO if we're saying this is a development agenda was a question that came in. And also, um, I'd like you to address the question on patents as well, um, African con countries granting uh, mm. patents. So those, those over to you, please. No, um, the question from uh, Sonia. Uh, I would like to start by saying that the integration agenda in the continent, especially market integration uh, in Africa, is not necessarily meant to be inconsistent with international trade agenda. Mm -hmm. That's the first point I would like to make. The second point I would, uh, want to make is that I talked about the issue of sequencing, I'm talking of strategic policy making. So you want to make sure that you come up with um, a policy agenda that makes it easy for you to succeed in whatever commitments you enter in or you prepare to enter in mm -hmm. because you are also a member of the global community. And a lot of African countries are members of the WTO and other multilateral institutions. So having said that, what the AFCFTA is doing is actually helping African countries to harmonize their policy frameworks in the different areas. And so once you have a protocol on intellectual property, for instance, mm -hmm. it is actually going to be a protocol that at least first of all addresses the question, why is it that in the continent we have very good entrepreneurs and innovators, and let's talk about inventions, and they never go beyond scale. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we have a very good story. I'm a Kenyan, so we have a very good story here about um, M-Pesa. Mm. Uh, M-Pesa probably came around about the time that you also had uh, the explosion of uh, Amazon, Alibaba, and other, and, other, and other system. And so the key question that comes to mind is, how many things like M-Pesa that did not even go national or regional or even global. So you want them to use the protocol on intellectual property to at least try to get a solution to creating scale within the continental market that allows African, innovation, African innovators be able to, 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 to play in that mm -hmm. space. So, so that's the whole idea of having these protocols on intellectual property, competition policy. I know we have, inter uh, we have, uh, you know, we have um, other global institutions that deal with these issues like this. We know that there's a whole agenda of investment facilitation at the WTO, but that does not stop us mm -hmm. as a continent to address these issues from a, an African perspective. And so that's my answer to, to this question. That we have an African perspective uh, in uh, the AFCFTA from a development approach in dealing with these issues, and they prepare us, or at least harmonize our policy thinking mm -hmm. when it comes to dealing with the rest, with the rest of the, with the rest of the world. Thank you. Um, so that's the. I'm trying to get the second question. Then yeah, there was the, a question. The patents. Actually, that's what I was trying to answer. Okay. Okay. So that's basically what I was trying to say on this issue of the patents. Mm -hmm. Then, and, and maybe what I could also add is that one of the reasons why, one of the challenges of industrialization and transformation in the continent, if, you, if I was to go technical like most of us here now, is we know that a transformation is also a function of innovation, yeah? So if we want to industrialize, then we have to be innovative. And unless we address this issue of uh, protecting uh, the innovations, right. 
and bring them up to scale, then we cannot actually be able to industrialize. So that is, those are some of the things that the AFCFTA is trying to address because the CFT at the same time, and this goes now to the second question about what is it that we are going to be trading. There is this uh, idea, many people say that in Kenya you produce tea, in Uganda you produce tea, in Ghana you produce cocoa, in Cote d'Ivoire you produce cocoa, in Angola, we produce oil. In Nigeria, we produce oil. And so because we are producing the same thing, then what is this thing that you're saying that you're going to deepen intra-African trade? And then we forget the idea of intra-African trade and the regional value chains, knowing that what I produce here can mm. be branded, can be redesigned, mm. and so we create a new, a new, a new value chain. Right. And the intellectual property processes would actually allow us to take advantage and or to optimize the use of these intermediate inputs as we create new regional value chains right. that eventually allow us to uh, leapfrog some of the segments of the global value chain. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, uh, you know, as a non-expert on this area of patents, just hearing the question come in, I, I, as an African, I felt a sense of repression and and that there are punitive measures imposed upon certain countries to ensure that they do not dare rise to, to issue patents. And, and some of these things I would question, I would like to understand better, and I think we need as a continent to be able to see what do we rally together. Yes, yeah. How do we rally together? Yeah. First of all, um, if you look at how much it costs, to register a patent uh, globally because there is that question mm -hmm. which many people don't address. Uh, it's a significant amount of money mm -hmm. for you to be able to register a patent globally. And we know most of this money goes to lawyers. Mm. Where are the lawyers based? Uh, now, and so, where is that so, yes. patent ultimately because, registered? Because you have to pay <laughs> for, to somebody to help you register in yeah. the European Union, in the United States, in Asia, in Japan. Now, through regional cooperation, it is possible for the African Union mm -hmm. and its members mm -hmm. even to come up with an idea of how they can facilitate dealing with these costs of ensuring that there is uh, protection of um, African patents so that Excellent. at least, and then you can recoup, you can recoup whatever it is that you have spent as a continent once this thing goes to scale. Excellent. So these are some of the things that hopefully as a continent through we'll these uh, conversations will we'll be, be included in the uh, yeah. CFTA, which it would be absolutely important. Thank you. Countries like America were built on some of these things. Yes. And if we don't give Africa the opportunity, then we are stealing from the continent. Um, <laughs> I, I come to your perspective now as you nod your head. Um, and, um, you know, uh, very interesting comments came in. Um, for some of our businesses, have we been able to really exploit the opportunities within our own nation states before we start saying we're looking at the African agenda? Um, what are your thoughts on, on that particular question? Okay. Um, I, I'll, I'll try and answer that, and then I'll add those a PayPal question from Burkina Yes, excellent. Thank, the, the you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank um, you. Actually, let me start with the PayPal question. Okay. So um, the, th this is just based on the fact that we don't have – that question is really from uh, the point of we don't have um, uh, big market players, African uh, payment systems, and that's born from that. And what, what's happening then is most people want to then hold on to uh, PayPal, and PayPal is a business. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they do their calculation and they figure out actually it's not safe for me um, to be. The, 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 thing that's always interesting is PayPal is in Togo, but it's not in some countries, mm. and you always have to ask. But then it's their own internal sort of calculation. They figure out it's. It works in this market, and we will be it's in too this risky market. in it's another too market. Risky in this other market, we don't understand this market, so we will not be there. There are fintech players in the market, so a, a lot of them out of Nigeria, but a lot of them are doing sort of the bigger markets first, which is which means that countries like Burkina Faso will not happen. Which is which is why I, my conversation around sort of deregulating and having actually a lot more patient capital mm -hmm. um, going into the payment mm -hmm. space is exceptionally important uh, because 
we suffer we suffer this in Ghana for a long while. We were lucky because we're in the sort of top five, top ten countries. And so once uh, Flutterwave and Paystack and Paga and those players began to come into the market, they started in Nigeria and they came to Ghana and this, you know so. I was I set up uh, an e-learning platform um, a couple of weeks ago, and it, working with Plato, it took me exactly ten minutes to connect to my bank account, to my my, wow. my payment system, mm-hmm. and code and build it. And that should happen across Africa. Um, at the moment, there isn't. Uh, I know there are some francophone solutions, but they're not. Uh, I think like Cash App, but they are also Africans in France building into the, you know, mm-hmm. so they're taking mm-hmm. their time. And so I, I don't particularly have a solution for you now, mm-hmm. but um, in this, the broader policy perspective, there has to be uh, a conversation about more money just flowing so that the current players can expand faster. Mm-hmm. Uh, even though a lot of money goes into FinTech, it just makes more sense for. Um, Another point is there's not enough local VCs in the mix. Mm -hmm. And so there is a growth in local angel investors. So the African Business Angels Network has done a really good job across Africa in the last five years in growing high net worth individuals who can then bring the seed money uh, at the beginning. But they're in, you know, they've done in Lagos, which Lagos, which is part of that, has done 1.5 million over the last three years. It's not a lot of money. So, you know, there's space going in there. Thank you. Let me move you quickly along to the whole question of, of, you know, exploiting potential in your own marketplace before we talk about Africa. Are we being overly ambitious? You know, are we doing everything we can in our own spaces? <laughs> Maybe. Well, I, here's what I think with, with any startup in uh, an environment where, or any company in an environment where uh, a, lot, a lot of companies are bootstrapping or, or using local angels, mm. um, it, they have to look at it from a cost-effective perspective, mm-hmm. right? So um, just as the same as the, the conversations about inclusivity going, oh, but why are we not, um, why are certain products not going into, into rural markets? It's really that the fact that the fact that in, you know, like for instance, if you're in Nigeria, you're, you're in Accra, or you're in, in Ghana, you're thinking three or four cities. So the, in Ghana, it's sort of the triangle. So the Accra, your Kumasi, maybe your Takradi, where oil is, right? Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. that's where you can maximize at the beginnings. And so uh, this will come with economic growth. We're not maximizing at the moment, okay. but it's, it's, it's not the fault of the, the, the organizations in the space. It is, it is really uh, an economic It is play. the environment. It, it is the lack play. of infrastructure. It is uh, un- fully understood. Uh, Hussein, let me, let me come to you now. And uh, you had uh, this specific question to you where uh, the gentleman from Burkina Faso, I think it was, was asking uh, about the platform not being a screen for larger businesses, which then front SMEs, um, you know, to, to make it appear like it's, it's really for them. And he also talked about the possibility of an African certification system. Maybe you can talk about those two issues. Ole. <laughs> well, um, the first one, please. Yes, so the first one, he, he was saying that this platform that you have, you know, the danger that, that exists is that big companies will come to sit on it and exploit it, um, you know, and, and front smaller companies to make it seem like it's for them. But am I to understand this platform is for everybody? So everybody should exploit it. Is that the, is well, that the case? Um, the, the fact of the matter is that um, once someone is registered with a post office to be able to be on that platform, first we recognize that person. We identify the person. We, they have to sign some, of course, uh, uh, confidential, uh, com- confidentiality agreement. Mm-hmm. And of course, the only thing, of course, is a bit technical area for me at this point in time. I wish I had my technical expert with me. But just to tell you that um, that uh, that person is officially registered, so we recognize them and register them. So large or small? Large or small, it doesn't matter. No one is fronting for nobody. Okay. That's the, that's the first point. The mm-hmm. second one. The second one. The second point was? Yeah. Oh, sorry. The second question was around the question of African certification. Well, I, yes. well um, African certification, uh, I, I don't think that is uh, an issue for the post because the moment we know who you are, 
We deal with other ports. Once you ship your goods, we know where they are going to. We have an address. We have also those the visibility of the people who it is going to. Mm -hmm. And of course, we are dealing with another postal administration or postal organization with which we have an international treaty and agreement right. on all exchange of goods and items. So in that sense, we are, we are secure. And uh, therefore, we do not require any individual personal certification for this. Okay, thank you. If I could ask the group at the back, order, order, order in the house. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> moving to this side, and Daniel, le let me come to you. Some very interesting comments were made um, around the whole idea of attitude and mindset, um, en enabling people to understand digital better so they come up using digital more. And one of the examples given was government actually delivering services on di digital or platforms, uh, but also uh, very interesting the whole idea of have we done enough even with what we have right now? And then let me come to the question from the lady over there who talked about quality of African products. You know, how do we d ensure that brands and productivity that we are building quality products that can fly across the African continent? Uh, it was a very impertinent question because mm -hmm. uh, I mean. We are talking about e-commerce, but what are we going to sell? To sell. I mean, it's it's so evident what you say is obvious, and the question is when we sell something into it, to what extent we can be profitable into it? Where the money will go finally? Uh, and if you take, you mentioned cocoa, for instance, it's a 100 billion dollar market, and only six billion goes to the farmers. The rest goes somewhere else. Wow. So how can we, if the e-commerce doesn't allow mm -hmm. to balance this uh, inequality, then we will miss uh, all the opportunities that uh, Africa can can raise from this uh, e-commerce. We can invest in infrastructure. We can invest in whatever, whatever we want. So we need champions. We need good producers, good growers. They need inputs. Mm. There's an opportunity to purchase inputs. They need credit, so we need solution, fin uh, financial solution to give them access to, mm -hmm. to agricultural credit. We need extension services. We need logistics. So all of this is a basis for a tremendous amount of transactions, where the e-commerce can be can be can be uh, can be the lev can leverage and develop these uh, activities. And also, at the end of the day, we want to provide clear data on this product so that the consumer at the end can trust and can be happy to pay for it. Mm. You know? This is why I'm, I spoke about honor honorability. Uh, because uh, the question is, if you make good quality products, mm -hmm. how you can ensure that the, the farmer will be paid or the artisan will be properly paid? The customer is sure that this product is good, the, product, the customer pays for it, but the, the way the money is spread, the revenue is spread along the chain is unacceptable. And people are willing to pay more to even ensure no that it is going... About it. Because, that it, you know, the yes. speech, those who are selling the product to the customer, those who are in contact with the customers, mm. they have the good speech. But the money stays in their hands. The money doesn't, it's not in Africa. So that's the reason why we need to invest also in our production capacity. We need to support our artisans, our, our, our producers. We need to invest in our capacity of transformation, mm -hmm. processing capacity, because if we continue to sell cocoa beans, <laughs> and we are doing, don't, don't, not doing bars, uh, chocolate bars, so you can understand that would be... Mm, quality but, chocolate bars, right. Everything is about quality, you're, you're right. And, and we need also to optimize our logistics to this, uh, to this consuming markets. Mm. And also, as I mentioned by uh, Mr. From, the, from Burkina Faso, mm. we need champion in the financial uh, segment as well. Right. Otherwise, I mean, PayPal doesn't have any reason to come in Burkina Faso today. They have other, other more attractive markets uh, that they want to go in. So we need to develop all of these. And I think, I think this is an opportunity, but I'm afraid that we can miss it if we only focus, we stay only focused on the technology. Right. We have to bring this e-commerce together with the, tradi with the uh, uh, traditional economy. Uh, we, we, we develop a concept of digital. <laughs> digital. Uh, uh, which beyond be the posture of the digital era. So where we, you have some physical investment that you have to do 
in factories, in, right. in warehouses, right. in people on the ground, so that at the end, yes, for sure the Africa e-commerce will be profitable for everybody. Thank you. So Daniel has taught us about honorability and he has taught us about FIGITAL, which is physical in, investment in physical infrastructure as well as, and, and, and capacity building, as I understand it, as well as the digital elements to make the technology work for Africa. Uh, Claire, we are closing the session. Your final thoughts. Thank you. Yes, that's a <laughs> huge responsibility. <laughs> yes, I would rebondir. J'aimerais rebondir sur ce que vous avez dit. Go back to what you said. Um, we have talked a lot about um, uh, uh, trade uh, and e-commerce of uh, physical goods, but what about services? Mm. What about uh, the, uh, an Uber uh, for uh, you know for an African country? And I understand in some countries it's already you know they're yes. already. What about an Airbnb for uh, for uh, for African countries? I mean, there's a whole uh, you know world of opportunities in the in the services sphere. You know, be in addition, not not instead, but in addition to the. The, the you know the trade uh, and the commerce of uh, of physical goods so that's also a, a new frontier for uh, I would think uh, for Africa and then my final point is going to be um, about the fact that uh, it is it is absolutely not only about technology you know <laughs> not at all um, and and so just just an encouragement to uh, to to for, for you to think about the digital transformation. Um, it's really about, it's a whole of society transformation. It's not just about different ways of selling goods or selling services. It's about different relationships between customers and, clients and, and, and the sellers. It's about different relationships between governments and citizens. The, um, the, uh, the, uh, sorry to use an overused term, but the transformational potential of uh, uh, digital technologies is, goes well beyond uh, the things we will be doing, we'll be able to do it. It can bring about a whole different way in which we relate to each other mm -hmm. as citizens uh, uh, and as, uh, you know, as uh, you know, fellow human beings as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, we've done a three-hour session. Can we give a warm round of applause to our panel? There's one question to say. Are you under 25? Yeah, um, not quite. Not quite. But I'm a young person and I'm here representing all the young people. Not only is laying on. Give us a final people. comment very yes, quickly. Yes, yes. I'm talking about mental health and young people, especially the women who are caregivers of these young children, maybe who have autism. And we know that technology can really help. Um, uh, transform this mental health sector, which is not if given a priority in the African government, okay? Mm -hmm. So, um, who can partner with my organization, which is Beautiful Minds, uh, to, to fight for the equality, inequality where the mothers, the caregivers, people who are really suffering and they have no voice, and technology can really play a big role, you know? So, um, Thank you. So if you're interested in partnering in yes, mental health, yes, yes. mothers of autistic children, children yes. then the young lady is over here. Thank you. Um, and that's how to be proactive, is to really make sure your voice is heard. A really big round of applause for this panel, please. And ladies and gentlemen, can you give yourselves a big round of applause for doing a three-hour afternoon session, for contributing so well? It is much appreciated. And Hussein says one for me please. <laughs> Only because he said. Um, ladies and gentlemen, as we close, one thing we did not really discuss was the importance of communications and media in this whole discussion around trade. And this is something we just need to keep our eye on. No time today, but let's keep an eye on it. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry.